I have been informed by the Hansard team that in order to be clearly visible, I should get permission to remove my mask. But that means you can only come to my bench if you have a mask. Because each one of us should be having a mask. And uh, you can see the distancing. You can see the distancing I have. So, in case of any doubt, you can consult Dr. Kaducho. Eh? Who can? Eh? <laughs> For your own, you know, benefit. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, I want to join you. I saw I was following most of you yesterday. I want to join uh, other leaders, uh, me, the right honorable speaker, and on your behalf congratulate the people of Kenya upon a successful election and also congratulate His Excellency William Ruto, President-elect, upon being elected as the President, Vice President of the Republic of Kenya. Our prayer is that uh, anyone who is not satisfied with the outcome of the election would indeed follow the legal process so that we can have peace in the region because what happens with our neighbors has a very very big impact uh, on us so we pray that the whole process concludes very very peacefully and uh, that would be setting an example on how indeed a credible election uh, is held. So we wish them well. And we. I, I was very happy with the remarks of the president elect when he said that uh, this is a win for Kenya and everyone would be included in the government and extended an all of the branch. So we pray that that was a message uh, which they will welcome so that peace can prevail. Uh, secondly, I want to take this opportunity to Welcome the government chief whip, the Honorable Hamson Oboa. He is made and sitting as a government chief whip. He has been uh, a member of parliament for 17 years. So I'm very sure we are going to tap into his experience very much. And I'm now glad that questions won't be coming from Honorable Nambeshu on why his number meet. <laughs> is missing. <laughs> uh, so, guys, uh, the check mix. Keep checking each other. Uh, build on the good rapport. You've all been colleagues in the house. And I don't have any inch of doubt, really, uh, on Hone Obua. I'm very sure that he's going to raise the bar extremely high. And that would be the benefit to the benefit of this house in general. Because when we have you know, high caliber individuals in positions of responsibility, then we benefit as a house. Uh, so colleagues, uh, with that, uh, allow me to call on uh, Honorable Bua, since this is your maiden, you know, appearance in the house as a government chief whip, you might be having some words of wisdom you want to share with our colleagues. Uh, thank you so much, Right Honorable Speaker. And I want to thank you for this opportunity. Right Honorable Speaker, for all intents and purposes, this is just like you have stated my maiden speech as Government Chief Whip of the Republic of Uganda. I have been away in my other early assignment as Minister of State for Education and Sports in charge of sports, as leader of delegation for Team Uganda to the World Athletics Championship, Oregon, and the Commonwealth Games 2022. My appointment came while I was out with Team Uganda. First and foremost, 
Permit me to thank His Excellency the President of the Republic of Uganda, General Yuweri Kaguta Museveni, who appointed me two years, seven months ago, as Minister of State for Education and Sports, in charge of sports. I also want to pay tribute to him for the recent appointment on elevation to the office of the government chief whip. Right Honorable Speaker, I am here to learn, I am here, I am here to work with my party, I am here to work with the executive arm of government. I want to commit that as government chief whip, I will work with parliament. The two presiding officers, the right honorable speaker, the right honorable deputy speaker, I will work with your respective offices. I will work with the right hand side of government, that is the NRM side, where I chair the parliamentary caucus, and I also commit to work together with the office of the leader of opposition and even members of the opposition, because Uganda is our country. We do not have a second choice country. Members of the independent, I am here to work together. I am here for us to work together. The UPDF, they are already part and partial of the bigger parliament that I mentioned earlier on. I also commit that, uh, right honorable speaker, I will, together with our team on this side attempt with due respect to up all the ideals that you cherish together with the right honorable speaker of evidence-based debate, evidence-based submission, evidence-based legislation. I also commit to be available when I am available. I also commit that my office will be open to all sides because whether NRM, independent or opposition, we all need services to our people. My office will be open to you, honorable members. Whether I'm there or not there, that is an office. There are issues that come on the floor, but when we talk even outside in our respective offices, we can handle them. I promise you, I want to well written, others are not written. I pray that we work as a team, we work. Right Honorable, I've said I will be available when available. You permit me to be out of the office of the Minister of State for Education and Sports, in charge of sports to my friend and brother, Honorable Peter Ogwang, at State House Nakas. My colleagues on the front bench to stand in for me. As as and when I'm available, I will be available. Honorable members, I want to thank you. May God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll allow your checkmate. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is to receive you with open hands, my colleague. We know each other inside out, and I hope you will measure. <laughs> uh, but, Mr. Speaker, mine was uh, to make a comment on your communication, especially giving congratulations to the Wanainchi of Kenya upon a peaceful election of their new president-elect. But Mr. Speaker, as you do also appreciate, the media, including state-owned media, was very balanced and given freedom to stream live all the results that were uh, being channeled into the public portal. And uh, indeed, the independent electoral Boundaries Commission 
in Kenya has demonstrated by word and deed that they are indeed independent because they channeled all the results from 34A, that is polling station, to a public portal, unlike in the neighboring countries, including ours. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if you were to follow religious and dutifully, which you did, I'm sure, the campaign trails, even the eventual vote, uh, voting, the rivals to the project of the head of state were given equivalent airtime on media. There was no tear gas, there was no torture, there were no anti riot police. Like in some countries where guns on the streets would be more than nurses in Morocco. So we could borrow this, Mr. Speaker, sir, from the neighborhood. That is my observation on what is happening. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I think uh, what is important is the laws being implemented in each country are passed by their parliaments. We are here, we are the ones who make the laws. So if there is something you appreciated, the task will be for you to incorporate it. But it takes two to tango, you know, it takes two to tango. So it's less, it's lessons for all of us, not only for those who are tear gassed, but also the tear gassers, if, if that's what it means. <laughs> so both of us must learn uh, from the process. And uh, of course, it, it was... Uh, but the process which everyone of us would appreciate. Yeah. you by the last one. Yes, Mr. Speaker, thank you so much. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you. I want to thank you and appreciate you uh, for a good eye to observe what transpired across in Kenya, especially your prayer of peace in the region. Because as Uganda, we, we depend a lot um, on what goes on. Anything that goes on in Kenya really affects us. So I think your message was really very critical at such a time. And the smile with which you said whatever you said looked like you're the person you supported uh, won. So I want to congratulate you uh, uh, very much upon that. But right on our speaker, whenever such things go on, as a country, we must pick and seriously pick lessons. No the Kenyan election was a very big lesson to us. When you look at the institutions within this process, Mr. Speaker, Mrs. Mr. Speaker, the institutions that caught my eye during the Kenya elections, right honorable speaker, were the key institution, especially the army. Despite the fact that the army was deployed, right honorable speaker, on the streets, they were not kidnapping the people. They were not doing things that we witnessed here, right honorable speaker. When you look at other institutions, the police and everyone, you looked at every institution was working for the people of Kenya. And as Ugandans, we may never bury our heads under the sun when, as we celebrate the good win the Kenyans went through, we must ensure that every institution here knows that there is a people of Uganda to serve, not just uh, an individual or a regime. Thank you very much, Right Honourable Speaker. Thank you. Um, colleagues uh, in the public gallery this afternoon, we have visitors of Namgongo Matters Church of Uganda from St. Mark's Kennington Diocese of Southwark, United Kingdom.
They include Reverend uh, Canon Stephen Colson, priest and former vicar of Namgongomata Church of Uganda. Uh, Rebecca Colson, spouse to Reverend Stephen. Emma White, daughter to Reverend Stephen. Christopher White, son-in-law to Reverend Stephen. And Emma Camp, daughter to Reverend Stephen. They have come to observe proceedings of this house. Join me in welcoming them. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, on matters of national importance, uh, gender, you have. Oh, let me first listen. Gender has become gender. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. And you know she's on the border. Right Honorable Speaker, I want to add my voice congratulate the Kenyans for concluding, concluding the elections in a peaceful manner. We who come from the borders, when there is no peace in Kenya, definitely we are the first recipients of our relatives from the other side who come and cross over to our, to our districts. So right honorable speaker, the issue that I wanted to state is also to congratulate the people of Kenya. So this time electing seven governors who are women. This right on. Honor, I would request let a colleague finish. Uh, I don't. See, I, I don't think this is an issue. Is uh, then I will allow you. Let a colleague finish. So right on the speaker, this particular time, the number of women rose from four from the 2017 elections to seven. And the women who were elected who directly competed with men were 22. And this we need to appreciate that slowly Kenya is appreciating the issue of uh, having women in leadership. Politics is not meant for men alone. The women also can. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. That's a very, very important point to note that Kenya is learning from us yes. here in Uganda. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Vice President Oman, Prime Minister Oman, Speaker Oman, you know, you see the front bench. We just have two men here and four women, in fact, five. So uh, uh, it's important and it should be noted how Kenya has learned from us. Yeah. Yes. Thank, on, you. On Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Kenyan election is very important, not only in East Africa, but Africa as a whole. Wouldn't it be procedural, right, Mr. Speaker? Create enough time on the other paper. On another day, such that we extensively exhaust the lessons learned. Because there are many good things to talk about the Kenyan election. Isn't it procedural, right, Mr. Speaker, to create time on other paper at a, a later date? As, as presiding officers, we are going to look at it because we have a concern whether we should be able to discuss issues of another country beyond congratulations and all that. Uh, you have to be very, very cautious. Sometimes the language goes beyond the limits of diplomacy. We might end up doing more harm uh, than good. So, Honorable uh, Chibumbi, you had procedure, Matt? Uh, right, Honorable Speaker, I should take this opportunity to, to welcome my brother, Honorable Obua, as a government chief whip. Uh, right, Honorable Speaker, I raised on a uh, point of procedure. Right, Honorable Speaker and Honorable colleagues, on Thursday, I rose again on the matter of procedure regarding to the numerous letters I've written to the clerk to parliament to avail to me as a shadow minister for finance, but even then as an ordinary member of parliament. Right Honorable Speaker, you promised to have a meeting on Friday that never came to pass. Right Honorable Speaker, I stand to raise the same procedure. The reason why I'm insisting on it is that the very essence and necessity 
or of us as members of parliament is the authenticity of the resolutions and the recommendations that we make. If by extension they are short changed, then our well meaning to the country is rendered useless. I have four resolutions that I'm following. I've followed the one of Achak, which for all intent and material purposes was altered. I'm following the one on Vince Coffee, right honorable speaker. It's a matter that I'll go to a very length to ensure that the sanctity and the authenticity of our resolutions are abided by, by all organs of the state. Then I'll write on the speaker. I'm raising on a point of procedure whether the clerk can decline to give me a resolution that was adopted and passed by this parliament. Thank you, Honorable Member. You've made uh, uh, a very grave allegation that the resolution for Akiak was altered. When a resolution is extracted, the Hansard is attached, the copy of the Hansard, which is a clear record of the proceedings, so that even the implementing officer or agent is able to follow the debate of that day. If the resolution is different from the record of the Hansard, then that implementing officer should be able to raise it and say, no, this is not. But I will request you, you give me a copy of the resolution of Atiak, uh, which you say was altered, because uh, when such an issue, such a statement is made on the floor of parliament, it's very close to questioning the legitimacy and integrity of this house. So I will request that you submit a copy of the altered resolution. We go, we compare whether it's not in line with the record on Hansard. On the one of uh, uh, on, on the one of Vinci, yes, I haven't gotten back to you, but I met the clerk. And the clerk for record, which can be captured here, clearly told me he downloaded the copy of the Hansard and he forwarded it to the executive for action. So, and that copy is a public document. It's on the website of Parliament. Anyone of you can access it. So I encourage colleagues, anyone who is interested in what was resolved on Vinci, please, you can access either from the Hansard office or even on the website of Parliament. It's a public. It's another uh, form 34A. It's, it's public. You can go and you check on it. I don't know whether that satisfies you. The, that should be enough. But right on, I will speak on the first one. Tomorrow, I undertake one to read the report of the committee that was adopted. To lay on this table a copy of the resolution on attack that I have to lay on table the hazard of that day. Please. And I'll do it tomorrow. Please. Uh, on the second one, right honorable speaker, uh, I'm not satisfied with that answer. Because the communication from parliament to the executive is not through the answer. It is through a resolution that is well processed. And the clerk cannot in any way say I'm incompetent, I just downloaded the then let the executive back out say anyway. So the point on the speaker. That's not that, that's not a language to use on our clerk. Let me withdraw the word the word incompetent. Yes. You found it not necessary to do the due diligence ought to do. Now, if we are exhausting the internal matter and I want it on record, is that I'll move to the High Court and compel him through the Public Information Act to avail me that copy. Honorable, that's your right, you can go ahead. Uh, no, colleagues, time is not on my side. Uh, we are going to continue. Adegua? Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. I'm coming from the communication you made, Right Honorable Speaker. 
to also congratulate Kenya for concluding oh, no, the election. That's not your procedure, Mata I'm, I'm coming on the procedure. No, right no, no, please. I don't have time, Honorable. Right, Honorable Speaker. Let me raise the procedure then. But uh, coming from that election of Kenya, where they have the first ever albino in the world to be an MP, right, Honorable Speaker, we are here in Parliament and all the proceedings of Parliament are relayed to the public. Wouldn't it be procedurally right for us to have an interpreter in this house? Right, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. That's for, for our television broadcast. Yes. Because the interpreters we have are for MPs uh, uh, who are not able to hear. So that one we are going to look at it administratively. Okay. Honorable Namuga, procedure? And colleagues, let procedure be procedure. All right, Honorable Speaker. Um, 108 billion was given to a truck sugar factory through a supplementary. Right, the factory. Right, Honorable Speaker, the procedure matter that I'm raising is are we proceeding very well when a company is banned and the ministry does not give a report and we just leave it at that? That one of the speaker, are we proceeding well? Thank you, Honorable Member. Yes, we are proceeding well. Procedure has to do with the day's business, and on today's business, we don't have a check. So we are proceeding well, right, Honorable Member? Procedure? Thank you very much. You can, raise, you can raise that matter in another forum. Thank you very much, Right Honourable Speaker. Okay. Right Honourable Speaker, his decision is to go to court mm -hmm. and compel the clerk to provide information. But Right Honourable Speaker, that will be a bad precedence to this House. Will it mean that every member that desires a resolution, that desires something about what we've concluded on, will need to go to court and uh, compel the clerk. Right on, Speaker, wouldn't we handle this better? And as a House, we take a decision on how members can take a decision, I mean, can get these resolutions, because, like you said, it is public information. But when we just leave it like this, right on, Speaker, I... I'm a bit worried that tomorrow I may need say the same. Do will I need also to go to court? Why don't we, right on our speaker, find a better mechanism on how members or how these resolutions can be made public and everyone can whatever part something we pass here, a resolution is also made public, the same way the answer is made public, right on our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. To see uh the Honorable Chivumbi has said he is not satisfied with what the clerk communicated. The clerk says, I submitted the answer. Okay? The answer has, but you voted on. The question was put, and that question was. So, and that's what he has said he gave. And it's available. I've communicated to you. It's available. He communicated the handset, he delivered the handset, and the handset is available. But only which wound says he's not satisfied. So once a member is not satisfied, it's his right to use other mechanisms to get satisfied. I, I think only Wachibundi is exercising his right. Okay? Because he's not satisfied with the administrative steps we've we've taken. Otherwise, these are public documents. Colleagues, you can go on the parliamentary website. You will find them there. Simple. So, uh, you know, you're coming to guide the speaker? No, I don't. I'm seeking your guidance, uh, Mr. Speaker, yes. sir. Uh, on, and uh, you no, see, what is the honor of Mwanga? Opposition chief. Yes. Yeah. I don't know that point. It could be procedure, it could be. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> procedure, but I know you know uh, what I'm driving at. Mr. Speaker, sir. Anyway, uh, it is true, uh, as you have put it, this information is uh, publicly available on uh, our parliamentary website. 
but what the Honorable Mwanga is trying to exhaust are the internal remedies which require certified copies of the answer, which the uh, responsible officer, who is uh, the clerk, has declined to avail him. That's why now he realizes he has virtually no other option other than seeking redress from the High Court. And uh, it would not, like the Honorable Shere put it, yeah. uh, it would make uh, this institution look a bit ugly. Uh, and uh, it may also set a very bad president, so to speak. No, not to, to me, because when you're saying it would set a bad president, it's as if there is something you're hiding. On a public document, it's not a bad precedent. Maybe it can also be a precedent which we shall be utilizing in future, uh, which can guide us. But this is a public document which is available. Whether it is a stamped one, whether it's whatever is on the website of Parliament is what is approved by the clerk and this house. So if any member reads and uh, is not satisfied, then you can. we have a procedure of correcting the record of Parliament. Okay, we have the whole chapter on, on correcting the record of parliament. Yes, and uh, and it's not that what they publish is final. If there is any mistake, we have a law that guides on correcting the record of parliament. But when I watch Vumbi, the one who raised the matter, and he has uh, he has given you his action, and uh, you cannot stop uh, a member. So matters of national importance. When I want to for his time is not on our side. I want to raise on the same matter. I've concluded on it. We are rotating around. Honorable Mutiwa, Honorable Opio Samuel. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I rise on a matter of national importance in regard to the looming hike in school fees in the third term. On the 29th of July this year, the national private friends, in which they indicated that they intend to increase school fees in the third term as a result of the astronomical rise in the food prices. We know that early this year, the schools reopened after two, uh, two years of a lockdown, and there are also reported increases in school fees. Right on was speaker, one of the worst affected segments is on the secondary schools. And as we speak right now from the UBOS data, the secondary school enrollment, national average data shows only 27.3% of children between the age of 13 to 18 years are enrolled in secondary school. When you come to primary school, it is 80%. The highest is in Kampala, which is at around just 52.4%. Northern region, you have actually at 7.2%, West Nile, at around 14.3%, Lango at 14.5%. In other words, there is low secondary school enrollment. And now we are having intended increases in the school fees. This is going to worsen the secondary school enrollment in this country. My prayers, therefore, is that one, the Ministry of Education intervenes. Earlier on, we received information that our plans to lay statutory instruments to regulate school fees which the Education Act provides and mandates the ministry towards that effect. The second thing, our prayer, is to ask also government to come up with measures to enhance secondary school enrollment in this country. As we speak right now, only 27.3% are enrolled. Primary school education is at 80%. And lastly, my prayer is to look at the fees structure. I have with me fees structures of two government-aided schools. And when you look at their fee structure, it has 28 items that are indicated on it. When you look at these 28 items, for example, these... Oh, we don't have much time, please just go on. So my request, therefore, as I talk about the secondary uh, school uh, fee structure, is to ask government to standardize it. Because if you're having 28 items on a school fee structure, for example, board of governor fees of 598,000 and the school with 1,000 students, that's 598 million. Going into just the board of governors, 
You look at school uniform. Are, are you comfortable to lay it on table, Honorable Mayor? Yes, I'll be willing to lay it on table um, to uh, provide my information on uh, this. Can you do it? So I, uh, as I conclude, therefore, I... Oh, no, you can just cross over here. You'll conclude after you've read the details of the school. Um, I hereby lay one, this is the Uganda National Household Survey 2019-2020, which is indicating the secondary school enrollment for... I also lay the school fee structure. This is for senior one students 2022. This is for St. Mary's College Kisubi. It is stamped and signed. And I also lay uh, this is the school fee structure. This is Gayaza High School uh, and is also stamped and signed. I beg to lay. Thank you, Honor Minister. Thank you so much. Right, Honorable Speaker. I want to thank my colleague, Honorable Opio Samuel, the MP for Colin North, for raising this very important matter at this very critical time. Right, Honorable Speaker, indeed it is true, given the escalating prices of commodities, including fees, food, and many other items, including scholasticas, the Minister of Education is not exceptional. True that schools have had conference and they plan to increase school fees due to the rising prices of commodities. And I want to inform this house that my ministry as by law, the Education Act of 2008 mandated to form a statutory instrument that regulates the school fees and other school-related matters. Colleagues, as we, as we pledge here sometimes back... Let, let, let the minister first. Oh, no, the no. ministry has already put in place the statutory instrument which is being reviewed by the Ministry of Justice and Constitutional Affairs. And in the meantime, before we bring out the instrument to be laid on the table here, there are procedures in the ministry for any school to increase the school fees through the Board of Governors, through the School Management Committee, which have got the representative of parents and other stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, I want to inform my colleague that indeed the issue of school fees is real, and the increment is real, but as a ministry, we already taken measures to ensure the school fees are within the framework for the parents as approved by the Board of Governors or by the School Management Committee. As far as the issue of law enrollment for secondary but, education... But, General Minister, that's what a member is complaining about. You're leaving it, you're leaving it to these people you know, your conclusion is really, you're leaving it to these people to go and determine whatever they want. For example, Board of Governors fees. Huh? Or, or, or procedure? Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I think it was February this year, just immediately after the first term, students returned to school. I brought a motion here concerning the issue of school fees and specifically the fact, right honorable speaker, that most of these schools that have been mentioned are grant-aided schools where government pays teachers and gives them even funding. But you find that they are even more expensive than the private schools, right honorable speaker. This motion, right honorable speaker, was referred to the Committee of Education. How I wish the Committee of Education can expedite its business and bring a report here regarding that matter. It is high time this parliament start, and we would rather stop grant aiding these schools 
and allowed the, this money to be sent to our seed secondary schools or to those other schools in our constituency. Thank you. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Chairperson on Education Committee is around. Um, no, Honorable, I don't know on what point you're standing, and I can't speak. No, that's not. The clarification is for the minister, not me, not the speaker. So, so uh, colleagues, now the Committee on Education, colleagues, I know this is a matter which can run out of one, and we don't even satisfy ourselves. Uh, we don't satisfy ourselves. So, uh, Committee on Education, the, the document presented, tabled on the floor, please take it up and report back to the House in two weeks' time. Committee on Education. So conclude on the matter, Honourable Minister, the one of peace we've, we've handled. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to conclude on the second issue that my colleague Honourable Piers raised on the issue of law enrollment on uh, secondary education as students. Indeed, it is true when you look at the primary education as they transit to secondary education, the enrollment has dropped because some opt to, to, to for the skilling and other training program. Oh. Yes, my ministry has taken steps in regards to sensitizing the public, the parents on the need to progress from primary education to secondary education. And I want to take that up and I want to pledge that we will intensify on the need for all of us to ensure that our children progress from primary up to secondary education. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to pledge once again our commitment as Ministry of Education and Sports to ensure that issues pertaining school fees and enrollment are really kept as part of the Thank you, Honorable Tamaguzi. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, raised on the matter of national support in my constituency of Nakaseke South. Right Honorable Speaker, last week, two young girls were strangled on their way from Namukeke Ranger School Park. They were strangled to death. The following day after, four more border border riders were also strangled to death. Uh, raised the uh, residents try to reach police stations nearby, but they did not get uh, necessary assistance, assistance they wanted, right, honorable speaker. The residents of Kapeka, Semuto, and Nakaseke are currently living in here, right, honorable speaker, and are still waiting for the response from the Minister of Internal Affairs or concerned organs to ensure that at least there is order and sanity in the area. But honorable speaker, my prayer is that the, the Minister of Internal Affairs should put up, should carry out some comprehensive investigations to know what actually is killing these people in the Nakaseke area. Otherwise, people are in fear. That's the right honorable speaker. It is high time as parliament, right honorable speaker, to look into the welfare of our officers in uniform. Most of these people, when they run to these officers to help them, they claim that they don't have fuel. Even their patrols don't work. So until right to number speaker, we look into the welfare of our officers in uniform, a lot of insecurity is still happening in our country. I submit and thank you, right honorable speaker. Thank you, Minister of Internal Affairs. The last one for, was for the chairperson. Committee on Defense, Honorable Milton. Right, Honorable Speaker, Norman. Honorable Members, I've taken note of the concerns of the Honorable Member, and I'll follow up with him to ensure that investigations are done and the culprits are brought to book. Thank you. Honorable Matiwa Joffrey. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, for the record, I'm Matiwa Joffrey Eric. I represent the people of Winyole West. Uh, right on our speaker, I rise on a matter of national importance regarding Wuhadio Hisiro Swamp, which has turned into a death trap. 
What one of speaker the above Trump connects the people of Uhadio to the islands of Hisiro in Winyal West Coast USA. What one of speaker, we have lost very many people uh, in the Antarctic cross, they say this one. And the most recent case is of one Wehoye Peter who was crossing using a canoe and drowned on the Saturday of 13th of, 13th of uh, August 2022. Right when I was speaker, many children from Hisiro Island have dropped out of school, while others have never stepped foot in any class because they have to cross it daily to access the nearby primary school of Buhadio. Right when I was speaker, my prayers are that you know, should expedite on the process of constructing the bridge because it's under the inner road that starts from Busoko, uh, going through Busaba and Buhadio. Then the second prayer is that the same road should be connected to the national roads must connect to either national road or to the district road. However, for this case, the road ends at a swamp, which separates the district of Kibuku and Vtareja. I you. thank you, right honorable speaker. Government. If we wanted it, it should be the maiden one for the chief whip. <laughs> Right, Honorable Speaker, the member raises two issues. One, to expedite on the construction of the bridge. My interpretation is that from your submission, this bridge is already in the plan and in the budget. What you need is the Ministry of Works, represented by ONRA, to expedite the process. This is my interpretation. The second issue you raise is the road be connected to Chibuku. I would want to say that the two matters will be drawn to the attention of the Minister of Works and Transport. And Honorable Member, if it pleases you, we could even get time and talk to the Minister of Works such that you can be in touch with him to make a follow up on the two issues you have raised. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Ababiku Jessica. Huh? Procedure Chimosha. Honorable Chimosha. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker. Issues. Some of these issues, Right Honorable Speaker, have a budget implication, which is it's okay, and members are in their full right to do that. But right on the speaker, these institutions are stuck and they don't have money, not even for fuel. I want your guidance. I want your guidance. And we're the one appropriating, and we know. I want your guidance, right on the speaker, procedure. Member, on, honorable colleague, you're protected. I want your guidance, for procedure. raising these issues and well knowing there is no budget we are the appropriators of this budget i really want to know procedurally whether we are proceeding right thank you uh uh, uh before honorable nandara comes you see if if i would be quite honorable chomosho was saying colleagues you were in this house last week you're the ones who are crying on how road fund and you to do with roads have been given more or less zero release. It's this house here. So, so a, 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 a colleague, what a colleague is saying is that even if we talk, these guys are not being given money. So I think what is important is for us to ensure that indeed money is available. Honorable Minister, you submitted the, the recordings. The, no, no, the Honorable Minister was supposed to submit to the crack uh, the releases for the road sector. Uh, did you do that, Honorable Minister? Yeah. 
that's why it corrects. I remember when I went to you, the one who raised that issue. When, yeah, when I was speaker, oh, we have been waiting for space to actually present the report. And uh, we are given, I think, was it last Thursday? We did not appear. Today we are not there. On a crack, put them on tomorrow's order paper. Okay? Because I haven't seen it in my office. Otherwise, I put on, uh, on the order paper what I've seen. What I haven't seen cannot get space. But if that is it, tomorrow we shall discuss this issue and comprehensively colleagues. Okay? Colleagues, we shouldn't go back to the same issue. Let us receive the report tomorrow. After receiving it, then we are able to discuss from an informed point of view. Uh, thank, you very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I think a colleague has raised a very important thing. What was the purpose of UNRWA of building a road? It ends at a swamp and it cannot cross. And you cannot come and say to the budget ratio because a purpose should have been that that road will serve a certain community. And if it's supposed to serve a certain community, UNRWA should have put in its budget. UNRWA should have put in its budget up to where it should reach. I don't think we should come here and start saying there are budget cuts. This cannot work because the purpose was to serve a community. So, Mr. Speaker, these are issues I, want, I wanted to ask. Can get another microphone, Honorable colleague? Mr. Speaker, Honorable Gorobi was the chair of the budget committee. And I don't think you are right to come and say there are issues. What you should come here to tell us, in your budget, did you budget for that road or to provide the service to that community? Because he has said children cannot go to school, people are being killed. And this is very dangerous, and it will be very dangerous for a government which cannot plan completely for a community. Then so, uh, Mr. Chief Speaker, me, I want to suggest, if you don't mind, that this is a serious matter. We would love tomorrow the Minister of Works to come with the reason why he built a road and stopped on the way instead of completing it so it serves the community. And that's what we should ask. Thank you. Um, a colleague has raised the procedure I haven't guided. <laughs> the issues are going to be very many colleagues. I tend to agree with uh, what Honor Wananda is saying. Because Honor uh, Chief Fipp, since you've committed, and tomorrow the Minister of Finance is tabling the report on releases to, uh, for the road fund and UNRWA, let the Minister of Works be here and explain this matter. Because this is, either, either it was done or it wasn't. Yeah? There is no research, much research needed to be done. It's a direct answer. So that tomorrow, uh, the people uh, of Bunyori can listen to the response that was raised by their colleague. Now, colleagues, you see, I hope, I hope the procedure I'm getting are not reinventing the same issue because the minister is coming tomorrow. Honorable Mara? Uh, thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, order. Honorable Mara, Omara is sitting here. He leaves the microphone here, he runs there. He is only Honorable Mara in order. To run around as if it is. Honorable colleague, you're free to choose whichever microphone. Yeah. <laughs> you see, a colleague might be planning to be on this side one day. That's one of Omara, you're warming up. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Right Honourable Speaker. I, I think this issue, there's a much broader issue. Uh, last week, the Minister of Finance was quoted uh, that to having said that it doesn't have money to run the economy. Right Honourable Speaker, this parliament 
passed an appropriation bill, which was assented to the president and became an appropriation act. This parliament also passed the Charter for Fiscal Responsibility, which, among other things, set targets and milestones, in, in one particular case, our debt levels. Uh, for the financial year 2022, 2023 at 53.1%. During the budget process, when the budget was being presented, the Ministry of Finance told us our debt level, debt to GDP, is at 49%. Right, Honorable Speaker, the Appropriation Act gives us leeway to borrow money. Actually, this budget parliament appropriated 30, 28 trillion shillings. Eight trillion was a, a rollover, and the other remaining part was debt. Right, Honorable Speaker. Would it not be procedurally right for the Minister of Finance when he comes here tomorrow to present to the country our financial positions in terms of implementing our budget, which we have passed, including making sure that they borrow sufficient money, which was approved by Parliament, that limit of our debt levels in our Charter for Fiscal Responsibility, so that we make money available to fund the budget. So there should be no issue of saying they don't have money to run the economy. I submit right on the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Karik. Uh, this is an issue which I refer to the committee responsible uh, for finance. Say to the minister, and committees be proactive, you know. We don't need it first, everything coming here. You know, sometimes you need to, to scrutinize a lot of data and a lot of figures, which you cannot do on the floor. So you need to go deeper. So I would refer this to the Committee on Finance through uh, the allegations as made. Uh, uh, Honorable Member, you want to agree or you don't want to agree? <laughs> I want to <laughs> agree with your guidance, uh, right, Honorable Speaker. But I just want to mention that actually the Ministry of Finance has been very slow, and, and I don't know why. We were supposed to have met them. Slow on what? We've scheduled two meetings so far, which they've not been able to honor. And I think the last one was this morning. Okay. And they didn't appear. So, so, so please. Right, Honorable. Honorable Minister, uh huh. The I think the chairperson is not fair. Mm. Last week, I spent the whole morning with them answering various issues. I don't know why you're saying we are not at PI. Today, I do not have that invitation for today. So, colleagues, you see, on the floor, it won't be your word against theirs. Yeah, we are not there. I didn't sit in. Minister and uh, government chief whip take up this matter to ensure that indeed. Uh, no, I've already guided on this matter, colleagues. I need to move. Please, please, please. Honorable Jessica Babiku. Honorable colleagues, I need to move, really. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for this opportunity as a representative of the people of Ajumani. Right Honorable Speaker, my matter is on worst spots of roads in Ajuman district. Yesterday, some of the community members were already demonstrating. And one of these roads is uh, from Ajuman town. Kimongula, from uh, Abiri to Sukari, Oliji Ogujebe, the bridge of uh, Oliji has never been worked on. Lastly, connecting a Germany through Singapore is a problem. My prayers, one, Minister of Works, she will go to, to a German district. He assess the choice of Oligy Bridge. Then to work on the three roads, lastly, on the Siwanya uh, ferry. Right on our speaker, I beg to submit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right on our Prime Minister and Chief Whip, ensure the Minister responds to this tomorrow. Also. Right on our speaker, like. 
Minister of uh, Ed, sorry, Minister of Works is supposed to come here with a report. So he will come with a comprehensive report on the roads, especially where there are bridges that are not connecting. So tomorrow I'm going to inform him. He will come with a, not, a comprehensive report. No, no right, Honourable Prime Minister. The report is from Minister of Finance. No, no, no. There is funding. Okay. Yeah, there is room for the for, for the Minister of Finance, but also the Minister of Works. These people want to hear from Minister of Works what why they are not responding. Right, Prime Minister, the order paper is mine. Okay. Now you're making the order. Thank you. <laughs> so what I guided, right, Honourable Prime Minister, for you to get me properly, was the Minister of Finance is going to table a report on releases. For the road. Minister of Works should come to address the question of Unyore plus this one and comment on the budget. Okay? Procedia. So, Procedia. But, but colleagues, Procedia. please, procedure is to do with proceedings yes. that are taking place here. Yes. Bring your procedure. Right Honourable Speaker, thank you so much. Right Honourable Speaker, you have instructed the Minister of Finance to come with the details of the release, but only in one sector, uh, which is uh, the road sector. My plea, Right Honourable Speaker, the release that released for, for the last quarter, whereas districts were expecting, uh, say, uh, a certain percentage, they received only 25% of what they were supposed. They sent money to the districts only for salaries. No money that was sent for anything to do the work for, for works. So, right honorable speaker, I am pleading to you the minister here briefs this parliament on the releases they just did in the last quarter and the the impact and what they have to plan for what these other agencies have got to do because we are talking about only the road sector but only may, may, most of the sectors right on our speaker suffered so my humble plea to you right on our speaker you add on the minister comes with other details in other sectors that were impacted by the absence of money and what government plans to do with them. Thank you. Thank you. But Honorable Korik, if you listen to me very well, that's what I instructed the minister to do with the Committee on Finance. Parliament can be briefed through plenary or through committees. And I emphasized that it involves the lots of figures which we cannot do justice to here. He will bring a statement, then it goes to finance. So I guided that the minister should appear before the committee of finance, present all these figures, then the committee will report to the floor when all of us have scrutinized deeply, and then we move forward. That's what I had guided from the onset. Honorable Gilbert Oranya. Honorable uh, uh, is whispering. I don't know why he has no confidence. Thank you, right honorable speaker. Right honorable speaker, I belong to the Committee of National Economy. And the statement a colleague said there, where the minister said they have no money, was made when we were meeting the cabinet minister of finance. Right honorable speaker, we shall always disturb your office with these issues, matters of national importance as far as roads are concerned, as far as this is concerned. Right on the speaker, they will even bring a report because the minister tomorrow is going to bring a report about the release. We have no remedy for that. Right on the speaker, would it be procedurally right? Because we, the, the two speakers we have are members of parliament. The issues that are happening in our constituencies are same issues happening in your constituencies. We don't need to be procedurally right, right, Honorable Speaker, because we know where the problem is. You hold an executive meeting. You hold a comprehensive meeting. Because Honorable Matia Kasaja was very clear and candid before the committee that I released what I had. I would have wished to release whatever you wanted 
Tomorrow, the minister is going to submit what he released, but it will not cure our problem. Right, Honorable Speaker, wouldn't it be procedurally right through your office to hold a very extensive meeting with the concerned authorities and you get the solution for this so that instead of coming here to read for us reports, we failed this, we did this, we get a solution. Otherwise, even if Honorable Golovi comes tomorrow to tell us what he released for Kamuli, it will not help me. Me, I want roads in Kamuli. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Korik. Korik, I want to guide. On a matter where I've already guided and ruled, please, I won't entertain procedure. Because you're challenging my ruling or guide. On a matter where I've already ruled or guided, I won't entertain procedure. Procedure should come on a matter where I've not yet pronounced myself as a presiding officer. Number two, these are issues that are not between the legislature and the executive. We first give the executive chance for each one of you. See, we want transparency to open up. Once they present here and we find that indeed we need to cross-check beyond what they've submitted, we always do. And we are always in touch. Uh, we are always in touch uh, with um, the prime minister, even with the leader of opposition. But we don't want to create a situation as if it's a crisis where the speaker must summon the prime minister, the minister of works, come and tell us where do we get money. No, no, no. They have their work to do. They must do it. If they don't do it, they answer here. Okay? So uh, let us give our committee a chance. And I believe our committees really do a good work. When they come to this committee, where you have all these able-minded uh, uh, people, I'm sure they will answer the most hard questions compared to when they meet just the presiding officer and give explanation. Honorable uh, Gilbert Oranya. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, arise on the matter of national importance. Concerning the high prevalence of malaria in a Choli sub region. Right. Right, speaker, according to the report released by Malaria Indicative Indicator Survey, in the month of July alone, 360 children below the age of 15 died out of malaria. Honorable Speaker, right now the government is ignoring malaria, yet many of our children are dying out of malaria. Honorable Speaker, in my district Amor alone, last month we lost 18 children out of malaria. My prayer, Honorable Speaker, I pray that government to take the issue of malaria very seriously. And two, I remember between 2010 and 2013, yeah. government was doing what we call indoor residual spray. And within that time, Reverend Speaker, there were no malaria in the Chinese region. It proved to be very effective at that particular time. And immediately, Government stopped the IRS spray. Malaria, the, the rate of malaria became very high. I pray that government should consider resuming indoor residual spray so that it is reduced the rate of malaria in a solid sub region. I beg to move. Honorable Minister of Health, for on matters of national importance, there is no information. Mr. Speaker, thank you very the... much, uh, Right Honorable Speaker, and thank you, Right Honorable Olanya, for raising this matter. Um, I remember in May this year, the Minister of Health raised the red flag on malaria because cases were going high. In June, we had another press conference at the media center and continued to tell people that malaria is back and in most especially in the areas of Osoga. At that time, I think we were losing about 24 kids. And uh, this malaria 
um, had so many other implications such that the children who got malaria were actually lacking blood and they had to be infused. The good news is the Ministry of Health is going to start a vaccination against malaria on all our children. It will be one of the diseases that will be vaccinated against. Like we've been vaccinating six killer diseases, but we shall start vaccinating against malaria, which is really the best way to go. Because if we don't vaccinate our children against malaria, then we are allowing this killer disease. Remember, there is no vaccine against malaria yet. But the vaccine has been manufactured to control malaria, especially in kids, because not many old people die of malaria. It is always attacking younger people. So government is working with other governments abroad that are producing this vaccine. And in future, we shall have no malaria in Uganda. About the residual spraying, um, we've done this many times. Even in homes, we do residual spraying, both indoor and outdoor. Problem is, within one week, mosquitoes are back. So if we can fight the Anopheles mosquito, which spreads malaria, then we will rid ourselves of malaria completely. And that's what the Ministry of Health is working on ending malaria in Uganda. Remember, we have ended polio. How? How was it done? Polio was done through Rotary International, through vaccinating all the children. Just a few cases that came back last year in August, but polio was not a, 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 a Thank you, story. Honor that uh, the members to you a serious prayer, Honorable Minister. The number one prayer was that you take malaria seriously. <laughs> so you've not committed on that. Uh, right, Honorable Speaker, I am sorry if I didn't satisfy them, but one thing is we take malaria very seriously. In the last two months, we've had several, several out, uh, uh, um, out of station visits to many places where we had upsurge of malaria and we, sub, we, we, we actually increased the number of mosquito nets in those very areas where there was malaria upsurge. No, no, I know you take and it very it, it, it really came a lot low. I know you take it very the Honorable Minister. Thank you. I've seen uh, you have invited me uh, or you have invited me uh, to for the launch of the indoor residual spray on Friday in Arua. It's in Arua, yes, it's in Arua. So, no, colleagues, please, we are, we are online. Huh? I know if I open up on malaria, the whole day will be gone. Yeah, there is a day we had, we have another paper, colleagues. Honorable uh, Asimuenos, I know each one of you you're going to make very good submissions, but we shall spend the whole day on malaria. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Uh, I rise on the matter of national importance relating to supply of coffee seedlings to farmers. Right Honorable Speaker, the, the planting season for coffee start, is starting in a, a few days from now. Okay. I raise an amount of national importance. On the, 50, on the 4th of May this year, I raised the same issue regarding uh, supply of coffee seedlings to farmers, being that it was the start of the season. The Holy Minister appeared on the 12th and made a commitment. Of course, he, made, he, he brought a statement which was telling us about government not having enough resources, but distribution to farmers and he said he's going to write a commitment to that effect then to ask also farmers to i mean uh, the nursery operator to allow him time to mobilize resources and pay, pay them in three installments but since the commitment he made on 12th of may there's no communication that has gone to ucda there's no communication that has come to parliament relating to that and the season the season the second season is starting in a few days from now. I now 
make my prayers right when I was speaker. That the Honorable Minister of Finance commits to farmers, the nursery operators, that you will pay them at a later date so that they can supply their seedlings and allow uh, 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 other farmers to plant in time. That is my first my first request. Number two, that commitment be presented on the floor parliament. Because the last time he said he's going to write a letter and send it to UCDA, which he never did. And the season passed without without suppliers getting seedlings. Thank you. The, the third uh, request, uh, right on your speaker, I want to use this opportunity to notify you to allow me space on the order paper in the, in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in a week or two, so that I can bring a motion regarding the coffee sector. Because the industrial commitment we had made to farmers on, under the policy. The on policy on policy. Colleague, when you're sure about your time, visit my office. Thank you so much. Um, no, no, Minister, this is an interesting issue. You have been giving siblings, and that's why you're celebrating everywhere how bags of coffee, you know, have increased and all that. And uh, from assessment, we are attributing that partly, greatly, to the distribution of siblings. Now, excuses were brought here saying no, all money was taken parish model, but the house appropriated money for siblings. Okay? If I can remember very well. Honorable Minister, even if we said the house, uh, you've, you've not yet implemented that, and you say you still want to go under parish model, you haven't released money for parish model. Parish model, the report, I, I hope uh, Chairman Onzima, you're ready, our report should come. But you have not yet even created circles, village circles. So me, the problem, Honorable Minister, the scenario we have, you have people who prepared their nursery babies. They borrowed money, that's what they have been doing. It's been their business. They borrowed from banks, from circles. They have the siblings ready. And all they were saying, well, no, even if you make for us an arrangement, we supply. And then you can pay us even in two years you face our supply. As we prepare for parish model, money to be used to come and buy siblings. Nothing has been done. The minister came here and agreed with that. He made a commitment. Now, farmers are calling us from everywhere. Huh? They are calling, these MPs are hiding from their farmers. On top of nursery bed operator, they are saying when your term started, they removed the siblings. No, Minister, what do we do about this? Is cough still a priority cash crop for this country? Right when I was speaker, I think it is an issue of strategy. We came here during the budget process at the budget framework level and also with the final estimate, with issues of strategy in there, particularly on the issue of repurposing the budget. And we took certain fundamental decisions because we had to look within the available resources to see how we repurpose those resources, particularly towards the parish development model. And doing that, in doing that, we are cognizant of the fact that apart from coffee, there were parts of the country, different ecological zones are involved in. We noted that whereas the Uganda Coffee Development Authority was distributing coffee, supplying seedlings, that there are inefficiencies here and there in terms of the distribution of and for input was demand driven and not supply driven. 
Rather, it was supply driven, it's the other way around, it was supply driven and not demand driven. And what we are doing now under the new strategy is to follow a demand driven approach within which we are availing resources, we are availing resources to the various parishes under the parish development model. Right when I was speaker, I was here last week and presented a detailed report on how far we had gone. The report was not discussed, co 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 but I had indicated co in co there. Honorable uh, Minister, Honorable Minister, just colleagues, colleagues, please. Colleagues, we have asked the minister. Let the minister respond. Yeah, but clarification is his right to accept or not, and he has refused. So, please, 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 I want the Honorable Minister to give us information. Just listen to him. He's a minister of finance. Yeah, and I knew what he was going to ask. Honorable Sam, I will allow you, but let us just. Uh, I, I knew what please, he was going to ask. Please let's allow the minister to give us information and honorable member, honorable minister, just take your seat. Honorable Abed Grand can correct. Clarification is a right for the member holding the throat, accept or not. You cannot force him and you don't need to be angry about it. If he feels he doesn't want to clarify to you anything, it's his right. So have peace. Please. Honorable Minister, you should only take clarification when you want, when you feel like you want. You're not forced to take clarification. Continue. Yeah, thank you so much, right Honorable Speaker, for the wise ruling. Um, Honorable Gono, we don't do business. I could predict what he was going to ask, but to a right honorable speaker, I wanted to indicate that in that report, we had indicated that we had gone a long way in establishing the parish uh, PDM circles. And in fact, we're at a stage of validating these various circles. And some of them have actually already entered the system, the integrated financial management system. I did indicate that. And since we are directing these we are releasing these resources direct to the circles, we wanted to do a thorough validation to make sure that the members of this circle are actually the, the real beneficiaries. Honorable, Honorable Minister, I think the answer you're giving us for now won't help us. I think tomorrow, tomorrow you can come uh, when we are discussing your statement, yeah. you, you would have revised this because our concern is simple. You're talking of validating of processes. Rain is not waiting for you. This is a planting season. It, it won't wait for you. It's very simple. God is not going to hold, you know, whatever he's doing, interfere with his season because you're, you're doing verification and all that. Now, what we are saying is very simple, now, Minister. Putting aside, by the way, your issues of parish development model, you have very many people who are struggling with seedlings. Go look through it. See it as executive. Even if you don't give us an answer now, just go back, take our concern in good faith, look at it. A very good example, colleagues. On parish model, on top of the 100 million for this financial year, there is a 17 million which was supposed to come for the other financial year. Now, and you said you're going to give us 17, 117. But if you sit down as an executive and you say, no, the 17, we are going to use it to address these concerns of like seedlings, for tea, for maize, for, yeah? then 100 million is the one we shall roll out with. On a appear, you, let me first allow one of Agnes appear. Thank you, Right Honorable yes. Speaker. I rise on a procedural issue that listening in to the Honorable Minister of Finance telling us about IFMIS and strategy, I wonder whether we're really proceeding right when we are still talking about systems and strategy when actually the first rain we lost in the drought. 
and now we're in the second reign. The 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 the, the acclaimed Paris development model has not been released, and it may not be released so soon. And we are talking about priority crops. When you talk about coffee, just be mindful that 800 billion of your budget is actually funded by that coffee, being the highest earning a crop in this country. And we have talked about this coffee in this house very many times, that if your strategy was good enough, by now you'd actually be laying to us an addendum of your strategy to tell us how you are going to manage the priority crops that as the Committee of Agriculture, we presented to you and said, as we go to parish development model, let's go in a phased manner. Let's consider priority crops. And as government, we continue investing to support our farmers. Are we really proceeding right, right on the speaker? Information. That the second rain has come and it is almost going. And the ministry is not coming out clearly how our farmers are going to be supported in this second so, season. Thank you. Colleagues, we are preempting tomorrow's debate. Uh, Honorable Minister, you've seen the concerns. Let, let's push it. No, let's push it tomorrow. Or all of it tomorrow. Oh. Tomorrow, the minister will have consulted colleagues. And, uh, what, what is important, what we need is a quality of answers. So let the minister go back and consult his colleagues so that tomorrow we are able to have... Uh, the sustainable debate. Uh, Honor, vamos. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, around 11 a.m. in the morning, the one called Ato Pasca with Jock was killed using pangas, spears, and arrows by the suspected Karamujong warriors. As we talk now, the body is lying in the house. Mr. Speaker, the Kejong's warrior pulled into their gardens. They move and wait for you with your oxen. They attack you from the gardens and remove your oxen. Not only that, they even come and follow you, even with the food, the cooked food that you are carrying and taking to the garden to the farmers who are there they go into the house and even take away those granaries that you are put in the house mr speaker the situation prayer. is escalating day and night my prayers are our updf men should start doing patrol also they should not just just sit in the detaches where they're being deployed let them move and do patrol. Number two, the areas like in Kaket, where the farmlands is, they should also put a detached there and move in those areas. Number three, Mr. Speaker, this situation is coming too much. If this house pleases, let the UPDF emphasize to bury these people also. Because each time they kill us, we are just suffering in this way. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move. Thank you. And this honorable person who has been killed, she is the honorable councillor of La Pana Scott County. Our Thank condolences, uh, honorable member. Uh, I think this is an internal affairs matter. I wouldn't want to immediately bring in uh, um, UPDF because it would need investigations to first know who did it and all of that. So, honorable minister of internal affairs. This matter. Uh, right, Honorable Speaker. I've had the concerns of Honorable Court. Indeed, it is an internal security matter. But because it's paramilitary, the APDF has been involved somehow. And there are uh, troop levels were increased recently. So I need to work with the leadership at defense and see how we can be more vigilant to ensure that these Karamojong don't come in. On the issue of the loss, I'll follow up with Honorable Court to see how we can help in the send of, of the councillor. Thank you. Finally, Honorable Batua. Yeah, thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I rise on a matter of national importance 
in regard to the frustrating process of getting a national ID by a part of Ugandans, the people called the Chotaras. Right Honorable Speaker, the Chotara people are half caste between Uganda and our brothers, the Indians, our brothers, the Arabs. And you can easily identify them by way of the skin and the So color. we call them half castes? We call them half castes. Uh, but locally, the most used name is Chotara. They are having a big problem obtaining the Ugandan national ID, including those who have been born in Uganda and those whose parents are born in Uganda, and they can trace up to their great grandparents. Right, Honorable Speaker. We would like to inquire from the minister that even when there is reasons to delay the process, which seems frustrating to them, is it possible to allocate a day at least in a sub-region because they are spread all over the country? Like in Busoga, is it possible to allocate a day, say in Jinja, where all those who are in a sub-region like Busoga can converge and try to iron out issues in the Ministry of Internal Affairs that are frustrating them from getting a national ID. Thank you. Honourable Minister of Internal Affairs. Pardon the concern of uh, Honourable Watua. Um, but first of all, the issue of national identity and citizenship is a creature of the law of the Constitution of Uganda. And uh, for those who are not citizens, there's also a procedure on how one can acquire citizenship. Regarding that peculiar constituency of Chotaras, like you call them, it is easy to go there in the field and hear their concerns and then advise how we can help them sort their problem, right, Honorable Speaker. Yeah, thank you. Next item. Item number three, statement by Minister on Government's decision to halt body organ examinations for migrant workers. Honorable Minister of Internal Affairs. Right, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members. Um, The issue of migrant labor is topical. Honorable colleague, kindly you can extend and take the conversation outside. Right, Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, like I said, this issue is topical for various reasons regarding one safety, skilling, tracking of our people who go abroad for work, especially in the Gulf states. My statement today regards the issue of organ extraction uh, as alleged uh, in the various quarters recently, including the press. The subject of body organ donation, extraction, and transplantation has attracted attention and concern lately, especially as far as protection of our migrant labor is concerned. The labor export companies have their views on this. So to the Minister of Gender and Labor, which is the docket ministry for labor export, as well as the Minister of Internal Affairs. Press has also been awash with alarming stories of Ugandans whose organs were reportedly extracted in the countries where they work. And other claims say organs are also extracted before they go. The idea of pre-travel examination of these Ugandans going abroad, especially to the Gulf states for employment, was therefore conceived within this broad context of seeking a solution to ensure that the safety of Ugandans against this risk uh, is put in place. Plus, we need to have 
institutional harmony and not work with that uh, cross purposes in this matter. After all, we all seek to ensure the safety of Ugandans. At internal affairs, we acknowledge that players, in addition to internal affairs, which is just a gateway, there are other players like the Minister of Gender, whose docket it is to regulate this sector. Uh, there is the Minister of Health, especially regarding examination of those who go out, as well as the labor export companies themselves, in order to ensure and formulate an agreed uh, safety uh, mechanism for our citizens going for work abroad. There's also the issue of consent by the individual supposed to undergo examination, as well as the choice of accredited facilities to conduct these examinations and the cost issues involved and who meets them. We shall therefore need consensus in all this, and we shall strive to achieve consensus with all the concerned parties. That said, however, we have in the offing the Uganda Human Organ Donation and Transplant Bill, which partly seeks to answer some of these concerns. And this provides timely and appropriate reference and reinforcement of the measures we all seek. The objective of this bill is to establish a legal framework for the regulation of organ, cell, and tissue donation and transplantation in Uganda by protecting the dignity and identity of every person and guarantee without discrimination, respect for his or her integrity and other rights and fundamental freedoms in regard to donation and transplantation of organs, tissues, and cells of human origin. Cabinet in that respect directed the Minister of Health to draft the Uganda Human Organ Donation and Tissue Transplant Bill. Accordingly, the Minister of Health drafted the principles for the proposed bill, which were approved by Cabinet, VIDE, Minute 126 CT, 2017, and also authorized the Minister of Health to issue drafting instructions for the first parliamentary council to draft this bill. The first parliamentary council, in collaboration with the other stakeholders, drafted the bill in line with the approved principles, except for principle five, which provides for the board. Sections 82 of the bill establish the human organ tissue and cell database and how data that is collected will be managed. There is the Privacy Act 2019, so that the two laws are synchronized. The Minister of Internal Affairs finds the bill exhaustive in achieving its set objectives of addressing the lacuna present in both the law and healthcare practice in Uganda in relation to organ, cell, and tissue donation and transplantation. This bill will therefore go a long way in bridging these gaps and improve healthcare in Uganda to the extent that this relates to the regulation of donation and transplantation of human organs and tissue, uh, tissues in Uganda. In addition, stakeholder consensus will be sought on the safety of our migrant labor, including on the issue of alleged organ extraction, whether here or in those countries where these young people go for employment. I thank you, and I beg to submit right to the speaker, and honorable members. Thank you. Thank you, honorable minister. Colleagues, this is a very clear statement. No, no need for debate. Uh, yes, because you see, two issues, colleagues, the issues were just two. Uh, one, one, we were saying that did you stop this? Did you stop the examination and all that? The minister said yes. I said he can only resume it when there is uh, a row to enable him to do that. And I said he's preparing the row. Now, 
our rule, rule 8 of our rules of procedure blocks us and special we, we are not yeah we are not going to discuss a matter where the minister has only said i will bring and he has not brought okay no you see uh, first of all rule 52 sub rule 2 says the statement may be discussed so it's the discretion of the speaker so, and, and, and when I'm using my discretion, I assess. I have assessed, apart from really rotating around, there is nothing we shall debate of value in addition to this statement. So I'm referring it to the Committee on Defense Affairs to help you when you're doing your work and the Committee on Gender. Next item. This is clear. Item number four. Item number four, motion for adoption of the report of the Committee of Equal Opportunities on the state of equal opportunities in selected sectors and affirmative action programs. No Minister? Oh, no, Chair. Chair, sorry. Chair, yeah, you, uh, you have 20 minutes. Of presentation the report was uploaded so we should have read it but we shall capture the whole report on the answer so that whoever is reading the answer in the future will be able to follow so let's do a summary thank and you. then we debate thank you right honorable speaker honorable samba i was saving more time for the <laughs> please thank you right honorable speaker Right Honourable Speaker and Honourable Members, allow me first to lay uh, some of the papers here on the table before I present the report of Equal Opportunities Committee. Right Honourable, allow me lay. Please, the floor is yours, uh, Honourable you. Chair. You have your 20 minutes, you know you want to use your 20 minutes. Right Honourable Speaker, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to lay the minutes of the meeting of the Committee of Equal Opportunities held on Thursday, 11th November 2021. I beg to lay. Right, Honorable Speaker, I beg to lay the minutes of the meeting of the Committee on Equal Opportunities held on Wednesday, 21st February 2022. I beg to lay. Right, Honorable Speaker, I also beg to lay the minutes of the meeting of the Committee on Equal Opportunities held on Wednesday, 23rd, I mean 22nd February 2022. I beg to lay. Again, Right, Honorable Speaker, I beg to lay the minutes of the meeting of the Committee of Equal Opportunities held on Wednesday, 23rd February 2022, in Napak District Headquarters. I beg to lay. Next, right honorable speaker, I beg to lay minutes of the meeting of the Committee of Equal Opportunities held on Tuesday, 17th May 2022. In Ibanda district headquarters. I beg to lay. Right, Honorable Speaker, I'm laying again the minutes of the meeting. Honorable Chair, can you lay all minutes at once? That's a practice. Thank you, Right, Honorable. I I had quite a number of minutes of the. Thank you for your guidance. I had so many. Now I beg to lay all these minutes at once. Then I also beg to lay the extract recommendations of selected sectors and affirmative action programs. I beg to lay. Thank you. And I also beg to lay the report I'm going to read right now, right, Honorable Speaker. Thank you. 
No, the moment you lay it becomes a, so it's a copy. You don't a copy. Yes. Please. Yeah. I'm laying a copy yes. of the report that I'm going to read right now. Thank you. Thank you, right honorable. Right honorable speaker, the committee on equal opportunities. its mandate from Article 90 of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda and is established by Rule 156 of the Rules of Procedure of Parliament of Uganda. It is entirely mandated with monitoring and promoting measures designed to enhance the equalization of opportunities and improvement in the quality of life and status of all peoples, including marginalized groups on the basis of gender, age, disability, traditional custom for the purpose of redressing imbalances that exist against them. Right Honorable, I have a small background here that I would like this uh, parliament to know that in that the 1995 constitution of the Republic of Uganda it puts women and all the vulnerable Ugandans in prime light. Chapter 4 of the constitution which stretches from Article 20 to 58 makes various provisions aimed at empowerment of women, children, persons with disabilities, ethnic minorities, among others. Ugandan population is estimated at 40 million people, according to UBOS 2019, out of which over 80% constitute the marginalized and vulnerable groups to which government of Uganda has committed affirmative action programs or grants so regarding women, right honorable, that constitute 52%, uh, government established the Uganda Women Entrepreneurship Program. And for the youth that constitute 80% of the population, government has also institu instituted Youth Venture Capital Fund and Youth Livelihood Program. Orphans and vulnerable children that constitute 55%, government put in place OVC programs. And there are also programs for persons with disabilities that they have benefited from the PWU grant. Then for all the persons, government have instituted the senior citizens grants and uh, it's rolled out to the entire country. And a number of programs have been put in place to support the other vulnerable groups, such as the ethnic minorities, uh, the rural and urban poor, and persons living with HIV AIDS, among others. Right Honorable Speaker, the Opportunities Committee conducted an assessment on the various programs under affirmative action. Marginalization, discrimination, and inequalities have been the nation's narrative before and during colonial times. Evidenced by high levels of poverty, insecurity, inequitable and poor service delivery, sectarianism, stigmatization, property grabbing, low production levels, denial of opportunities in the various spheres of life, and inequalities to mention that a few. Uganda's history has been marred in a series of events that subjected some of its citizens, such as ethnic minorities, persons with disabilities, older persons, youth, women, the poor, orphans, and vulnerable children to a higher level of vulnerability. Right Honorable Article 32 1 of the 1995 Constitution of the Republic of Uganda states that notwithstanding anything in this constitution, the state shall take affirmative action in favor of groups marginalized on the basis of gender, age, disability, or any other reason created by history, tradition, or custom for the purpose of redressing imbalances that exist against them. So to promote equal opportunities for all Ugandans, the government has established legal and policy, uh, policy framework. Furthermore, the government of Uganda is a signatory to several international and regional instruments to promote equal opportunities. For instance, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, 1966, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, 1966, the Declaration on the Rights of Minorities, 1992, the Convention 
on the rights of the child 1989, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, SEDU 1979, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, 2006, the Sustainable Development Goals 2015, the Declaration on Elimination of Violence Against Women, Davo 1993, the Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention 1989, among others. Honorable Chair. Right, Honorable. Honorable Chair, you have only 20 minutes. Yes, and right, I can Honorable. see you reading each and every word. Kind of go to observations and recommendations. On page okay, seven. right, Honorable. On page seven. We have this page. report. We have this report. So you know, some members, I think that's why we've had a carriage of members reading from here. When the chair is presenting, <laughs> that's when members are reading. You know? That's why we submit reports early. Uh, thank, thank you, right, Honorable. Okay. Uh, allow me to mention the districts that we visited and we got this uh, Please, report. You have from... 20 minutes. After okay. 20 minutes, I'm cutting off. Uh, thank you so much, right, Honorable. The committee conducted. Uh, Agago, Aleppo, Pole, Napak, Ngora, Kaliro, Shema, Buwejo, Mitoma, Bushenyi, and Ibanda. Right Honorable, uh, that is page five. We are going to findings, observations, and recommendations. Um, these are the areas that we were looking uh, at during our visit. During our visits to the to the to do to those districts, but then before we went to those districts, right honourable, we had a meeting with uh, the Minister of State for Education and uh, the management of Higher Education Students Financing Board. That in the later stage, I will come also with that report and read. It is included in this report. So I wanted this house to know uh, what we did, the observations we made. So the following key findings, observation, recommendations have been identified for immediate action for various programs and affirmative actions and other equalization programs to be implemented in the short to medium term. Right honorable, the status of equal opportunities in education sector, the attainment of equality and inclusive, inclusivity in development is significantly predicted on the state of well-being, skills and competitiveness of the various categories of individuals and groups in society are cited with a sustainable development goal for quality education, while well-being is dependent on the quality of healthcare services. Right honorable, considering that government of Uganda has over the past decades made significant gains in education through inter -alia, universalizing primary and secondary education. According to the recently released results, the performance of primary living examination in Northern Uganda, Northern subregions, for instance, stands below the national average. So the committee noted that the average distance traveled by students or pupils to reach their respective schools, majority of these districts visited reported that students moved the distance of more than five kilometers and none has complained of about long distance travel from home to school. Uh, they reported that uh, uh, this was associated with the challenges of rape, uh, late reporting to school, early departure, and inability to complete the home school work due to fatigue or late arrival at school. So, regarding access to the school environment, especially for visually impaired uh, learners, school since they lacked uh, landmarks, then wheelchairs users also find it very difficult to access education facilities in these districts. So right honorable speaker, distance to the nearest facility influences access to education services. The Ministry of Education standard is very, is that every parish should have a primary school and secondary school at, uh, at every sub county level. So this policy would make education accessible at that level. And on the other hand, secondary and tertiary institutions were far and inadequate in many parts of the sample areas. This made it very hard for most of the children from hard to reach areas to progress to secondary level. Other children keep repeating primary seven because of no access to secondary education. 
and evaluating sustainable development goals, it's only nine years to be achieved, and districts are badly performing with one secondary school. So the teenage pregnancy has also increased due to lockdown. The committee further observed that cost of education services is a determinant in access to education, and many people pay highly for education in private schools, and those who do not pay any money to schools meet cost of scholastic materials, like between 100 and 150, that is very high for the rural areas. Now, in private schools, especially in urban areas, the cost is much higher compared to government-aided education facilities. The committee observed that dropout rate is very high, for instance, in Napak district at 84. Special needs uh, schools, like in Bushenyi district, uh, the structure is very dilapidated, no renovation done, and most districts have no special needs uh, schools that the children with disabilities should go to. Um, specific observations, uh, right honorable speaker, I'm coming to the issue of the student loan scheme. The committee observed that in an effort to assess regional balances, in the operationalization of higher education students financing board, a statutory body established by the Higher Education Students Financing Act, uh, number two of 2014, with a mandate to provide loans and scholarships to Ugandans, to, to Ugandan students seeking to pursue higher education. In Wara district, two students benefited the time we went. Kaliru, only one student, Kole, we had three. Father four uh, from the loan scheme in that previous academic year, and students from most of the districts have failed to access loan scheme due to little or no information given. The committee noted that there is no regional balance in the words for student loan scheme, especially for Northern, Eastern, and Karamoja, with the lowest number of beneficiaries. When it came to staffing, right honorable, whereas schools had staff establishment, less than 68% are staffing levels in, the, in most of the districts visited. With Napak district in Karamoja with the least, with 53%, this adversely affects the quality of teaching and learning. Napak district uh, had teachers to pupils ratio at one to 91. High school dropout, the committee observed the highest that I'd already mentioned at 84, that is NAPAC. And um, after primary seven, uh, some, some pupils do not have where to go, and others repeat P7 four times because they cannot join secondary education. So their parents cannot afford to pay uh, school fees and also giving other requirements. Then uh, the parents, uh, okay, the distance to the schools was also a big challenge because we found that children were walking about 14 kilometers going to access education in primary schools. So do these children have better opportunity really for education? Uh, this has also led to girls to getting married early uh, while boys end up in pursuit of livelihoods. Inadequate furniture and desks for pupils, there's need to procure more. We also saw that this was also a challenge. Uh, then in secondary education, secondary schools, the committee, however, noted that government has increased number of, sec uh, of seed secondary schools in many sub-counties, and construction was ongoing in most of the seed schools. The committee appreciates government efforts to ensure that there is at least a government secondary school in every sub-county although they are still being constructed. Recommendations, uh, right from the speaker. Number one, the Ministry of Education and Sports should provide for special needs children to benefit from inclusive edu education. The washrooms and sanitary facilities for children with disabilities be provided in all the schools. Student loan schemes should be made accessible to all the students that intend to borrow the funds for further studies and more information about the loan scheme be given to the public to enable accessibility. Uh, then the district quota system should be introduced for higher student financing board, that is the loan scheme. 
so that all the districts will have equal number of students accessing the student's loan scheme. Ministry of Education and Sports should prioritize special needs education. Uh, special needs grant uh, should be allocated to all districts and regional uh, special needs schools to be created at all regional levels. Ministry of Education and Sports should ensure equitable recruitment of specialized teachers trained in handling students who are living with disabilities in all government schools to ensure access to education. The committee also recommends that Ministry of Education and Sports should make a plan setting concrete targets for improving the quality of primary education, particularly in rural areas, reducing the high dropout rate in primary schools, improving literacy and numeracy, and increasing enrollment in secondary schools. Government should establish special education curriculum uh, for the youth who can no longer join formal education. This right, honorable speaker, Ministry of Education and Sports should um, should explore the viability, the viability of available of availing relevant textbooks to to primary school. I mean, to public schools in some of these marginalized communities. The ultimate goal of such intervention should not only increase enrollment, but also aid retention and improve learning outcomes at all levels of education value chain. Ministry of Education and Sports should implement government policy of having government-aided schools, uh, primary schools at all parishes to reduce uh, inaccessibility. Purpose of equal opportunities in the health sector, right, Honorable? Um, when we went, the committee observed that the availability of health facilities has enhanced physical access to health care by communities. However, the long distance to health facilities is one of the barriers to access health care services. The committee noted that most communities travel more than five kilometers from their households. In Nora district, not every sub county has health center three. The policy of availability of health center three in every sub county should be implemented to reduce on the long distance. So there's need for affirmative action to be done to construct health facilities in rural areas for the health facilities whose distance to the nearest health facility is still more than five kilometers. So due to the few facilities in other districts visited, the number of patients are overwhelming. And in Bumanya Health Center for Kaliro District, the committee found patients in patients' rooms, <laughs> They found patients sharing in patients' rooms, both women and men, sleeping in the same room, and they were admitted there. So in Kabul, also health center. So in Iba and the district, all dilapidated, with no space for admission and no running water in place, and water was being ferried in jerry cans, and uh, the oxygen cylinders were available, but without heads. Hence, they were non-operational. The delivery room in the maternity was very small, but uh, two delivery beds were available, which were very inadequate given the number of deliveries per day. The maternity was in a very bad shape. Members noted that government should provide all measures to ensure that no woman dies while giving birth. Ambulance services should be available for referral at all times. That honorable speaker. The committee noted that government should strengthen service delivery standards and systems to enhance the health services delivered to Ugandans, especially the vulnerable and marginalized groups of people. There should be equal access so, uh, to opportunities across all aspects of life as a major prerequisite, prerequisite, prerequisite for inclusive growth, socioeconomic transformation, and sustained human welfare and development improvement. The committee also observed that government policy was intended to have the health center threes in all the sub counties and health center fours in every county or constituency. This is not, however, the case in many districts. And therefore, women are still dying while giving birth due to limited access to the health care facilities. The committee also observed that the district, uh, the district that we visited, like, uh, like Ibanda, uh, the training committee that coordinates career development activities of healthcare workers. The training committee reviews and accesses staff applications and recommends to the district service commission for authority to award study leave with pay uh, as support to guide or guide accordingly. 
Uh, but this is something that usually happens. Let me go to, to another thing. Um, right, Honorable uh, Speaker, the committee also observed that there were many districts. I think I've already talked about this. The um, committee said that the ministry. Honorable Chair, can you conclude? <laughs> I can now go to work and transport, um, right, Honorable? Ministry of Works. The committee uh, could not easily connect from Ibanda district to Buwejo district due to the bad road network, right, Honorable? Uh, we had to travel back to Mbarara in order to connect to Buwejo. There should be possible ways in which road network can be improved in those districts, right, Honorable, with very poor uh, road network. And this is something that we have ever uh, complained about. Right, Honorable, in Ngora, the Ngora road going to Palisa was also a menace. It was not accessible due to an LS bridge that needs upgrading. And in Napak district, the roads were also very bad. And it was worse during uh, the rainy season where most roads um, uh, became impassable. So this also hindered our, our oversight visit. Now we recommend that the Ministry of Works and Transport should evaluate the state of all the major roads and establish a redevelopment strategy so as to improve accessibility and livelihood. Uh, government devotes resources to the improvement of roads in the said area. This is a, a precondition for the movement of people, goods and services, and meaningful engagement uh, in production. That will allow me to talk about water and environment sector. Um, the committee observed that other areas in the country lack clean water and access was not easy. In Buweju uh, district, women moved many kilometers uh, in order to access water. In the park district, there is need for really deep wells, and really the uh, water crisis was a great problem in that area. So we realized that water distribution is not fair to the community where, uh, like in the park, 146 villages do not have any water sources. So they obtain their water from ponds, which is not very clean, and uh, they also move very long distances to access the same. The committee uh, observed that latrine coverage in Napak was at 35, I mean 37 percent, and most of the community members uh, still practice open defecation uh, with very high poverty level. Of the water scarcity, in hard to reach areas and provide possible solutions to that effect and the ministry of agriculture animal industry and fisheries should support the marginalized groups with improved seeds seedlings and uh, farming tools now on the um, youth livelihood this is the social sector that we also looked at as affirmative action given uh, to the communities we looked at uh, youth livelihood and we found that uh, right honorable uh, let me go to to our findings. It was very interesting that, uh, okay, our observation on page 17, it was noted that there were no funds under the program, that is youth livelihood, at the district level to, to police recoveries. This exacerbated the recovery challenges. The situation was compounded by COVID pandemic related uh, challenges in the country. The attitude of the community towards youth livelihood, livelihood program, just like many other government programs, <laughs> complicates the recovery process. Communities mostly think that government must always provide them with free things and that even revolving funds or loans should not be paid back. Defaulting and delays in the payment of loans or revolving capital, especially due to uh, timing of the programs, which in most cases happen during election period and beneficiaries take it as a, a thank you for elected leaders. The funds dwindle, yet the districts were not informed of the dwindling funds and the reasoning uh, behind to enable them plan accordingly. 
So in Agago District, right on the ball, Agago District had, uh, had funded youth programs under youth livelihood to a tune of 1 billion, uh, 39 million, 743,500 at the time of the visit that we made in September 2021. But the total recoveries uh, was only 270. Now you see, that is uh, that was realized between 2015 and 2019, about four years. That was the recovery for uh, Agago. I'm just giving as an example. Oh, when you come to when you come to the recommendations here, uh, Ministry of Gender, Labour and Social Development should ensure that youth livelihood program guidelines are reviewed to provide for a specific threshold for youth with disabilities also. For avoidance of doubt, uh, the committee has recommended at least 5% of the beneficiaries be youth with disabilities. Uh, Ministry of Gender, Labour and Social Development should also ensure that uh, programs, program documents, uh, training modules and guidelines are simplified and translated in various languages, appropriate formats and modes, so as to target all the beneficiaries. Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development should ensure that co entrepreneurs to mold the youth into the business of their choice through apprenticeship program before they are left to independent gender should revisit the criteria of group formation to a smaller number that is like between five to eight members and also be flexible on the membership of the group to extend beyond villages to at least uh, Paris level. Ministry of Gender should empower the youth for wealth creation and districts should develop recovery strategies and recover youth livelihood funds given to the youth. Right, Honorable, uh, we also touched on the venture capital that was given to some, some districts, and we noted that the youth capital venture fund that was given, uh, some districts uh, have not received them, have not received it, like NAPAC, and many district leaders are not aware of the youth capital venture fund. Maybe the ministry will tell us about this, but we recommend that sensitization be done uh, by Minister of Gender, Youth, Labor and Social Development on Youth Capital Venture Fund that was given to uh, to Centenary Bank to give our youth on a low a low interest rate of 11 percent. And then uh, Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development should develop strategy to roll out Youth Venture Capital Fund. Right, Honorable, I'm about to finish. Um, I have. Uh, recommendations on OEP. Right, Honorable, on Uganda Women Entrepreneurship Program, we noted that the target beneficiaries of the program are women, yes, within the age bracket of uh, 18 to 65, and this is a revolving fund. The major issues are delayed transfer of funds from ministry to local government, Poor payment of revolving funds, inadequate operational facilitation for CDOs on follow up for recoveries uh, was inadequate and lack of ownership of the program by the community and limited funding of the special program. So we recommended that Ministry of Gender and Labor and Social Development should conduct more awareness raising. They should simplify documents like in youth livelihood. They should also intervene by holding partnership meetings with the bank to enable women have checkbooks with savings accounts, as well as opening for women groups accounts with no minimum balance required. And also uh, should trans transport should be availed for CBOs for mobilization to facilitate recovery. And there should be timely disbursement of funds, then engagement of stakeholders to really, really enable mindset change. And this was also a very uh, big challenge. For the special grant for persons with disabilities, uh, right honorable, the committee observed that there are other people with disabilities uh, missing out on services due to communication challenges. And there are no sign language interpreters in many public institutions, 
Hence, the government should develop comprehensive strategies to ensure that no one is left behind while providing essential social services to the community. So we recommended uh, government uh, to develop a data bank, uh, disaggregated data on persons living with disability. A Ministry of Public Service should ensure that every public office should, I, should have sign language interpreters and special grants for persons with disability uh, programs should be uh, incorporated. Right Honorable Speaker, the committee also looked at the social assistance grant for empowerment. We observed that women tend to age quickly compared to men due to hard work, labor, and effects of childbearing. So government policy provides the age of beneficiaries at the affirmative action and their age be reduced from 80 years to 65 years, right, Honorable? <laughs> Thank you, right, Honorable. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, as I proceed, right, Honorable, uh, yes, affirmative action for women by reducing the age of the beneficiaries from 80 years to 65 is what we are recommending. And then there should be annual increment uh, to the monthly payment of the 25,000 given to the beneficiaries by at least 10% due to inflation rate. Her right honorable speaker, there are days that we always celebrate. These are other issues affecting the vulnerable groups. We have celebration of international days. Right honorable, we observe that budgetary allocation to the vulnerable groups has remained inadequate over a period of time. Youth in districts cannot organize National Youth Day. Disabled persons and older persons cannot organize International Day for the disabled persons. And International Day for older persons. Then International Women Days are usually organized by political leaders, especially the women members of parliament, while government through Ministry of Gender organizes only at national level. The recommendation that we made here is that, right honorable, government should take up the responsibility of organizing such international days, like International Women's Days, International Youth Days, International Day for Disabled Persons or Older Persons at district level for accessibility. Um, right, Honorable Speaker, we also touched on the, the issue of uh, distribution of electricity because this is also uh, one of the things that can bring development in an area and, uh, and can address the issue of poverty. We, we found out that um, the rural electrification program has improved access to electricity in rural areas and the committee appreciates the there were issues of accessibility uh wires were passing by the trading centers but due to poverty level many families could not access electricity uh, connection fees or charges those charges were high the yaka cost is also very high and the policy that uh the building to be connected should be a permanent building. Not many families can afford to build uh, permanent houses in rural areas. Uh, that's a very big challenge. And uh, people who have temporary buildings are not getting uh, power. Right, Honorable, uh, we recommended that connection fees and electricity costs should be reduced to increase on the access to electricity. And Minister of Energy should review the policy for power connection in rural areas. And then, right, Honorable, uh, there were many things that we also looked at, like the poverty rate. I think this is the last one. And insecurity. The committee observed that the poverty rate in other districts was high. That one I already mentioned, especially in Karamoja sub region. In the park where the committee visited, there was no bank, no court. No piped water, 
there was border conflict and many others. So the district border conflict was also affecting service delivery in the districts. Uh, for instance, when the districts want to, to provide services like immunization. The poverty rate is also affecting recovery of funds, such as disability funds and youth livelihood that I talked about. Uh, poverty rate and insecurity were affecting the staffing levels also in such districts. We found many workers had already left and they never wanted to work. Right honorable speaker and honorable members, the government of Uganda should be able to ensure greater equity and inclusivity in all spheres of the management of public affairs, basic social services, improving livelihoods, ensuring equity in appointments to public offices, and peaceful co coexistence. There are regions that historically lagged behind in many aspects of socioeconomic progress that require more efforts to actually cause a qualitative improvement in household socioeconomic conditions as a strategy to enhance the feeling of nationhood amongst the citizen. I beg to move this report and i i beg that this report be adopted subject to recommendations therein i beg to submit honorable speaker thank you thank you honorable colleague but for the good report uh, this is your first report um, you've taken long you've moved around the whole country trying to do a very good and commendable job which you've done according to what I'm seeing in the report. But, but I'm concerned out of 39 members, only 15 could sign. And I'm seeing many members here who are members of the committee. No, for a whole year, you can't get signatures. Eh? You, you produce one report in a year and you cannot produce, you cannot sign it even. Eh? It means you never did anything for your committee if you can't sign it. A report that has taken a full year to. So this has to be taken seriously. Members, if you don't sign a report and there is no minority report, we shall maybe require you to explain why. Where are you wrong? Yeah. Huh? And uh, I urge chairpersons of committees in such a situation always share with the whips where you get challenges of signing reports. So that the party whips could deploy members. Of what they are doing. So, one of our colleagues, before we go any further, I forgot in my communication, I was supposed to uh, announce the unfortunate death of uh, the Honorable Jessica Rio, a uh, former woman MP of Ajumani, former Minister of State for Environment, and former Deputy Secretary General of the South African Community. She was our colleague, she passed on in the US. Due to cancer, which is extremely very unfortunate. Yes. So I call upon you to stand so that you can pay respect to our foreign community. May her soul rest in eternal peace. Thank you. Uh, we are going to debate this report for 45 minutes and debate starts now. Yes. Thank you. I'll start with uh, Hona Ebondesi. Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing members of the committee standing up. <laughs> if you know you're a member of the committee, kindly sit down. Because I've read through, I know, I know members. And some of you didn't sign. <laughs> your members <laughs> so you, you will allow my first pick on Evondesi. i pick napak because i've seen uh, napak are really issues uh, are very many i i've taken long without being on a banga a submitting no i'm going to give you time uh i'm going to pick uh honorable mawanda i pick honorable kawunde uh, and Honorable Christine Kumi, then I come here. 
Yeah. And each one of us, two minutes. Ah. Raka, please sit the clock. Right on speaker. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I need to say that uh, this report is one of the most useful and the best reports we have so far received in this parliament. Based on my appreciation to the committee. Due to time constraints, I will try to summarize my points. But in general, I support the committee and the adoption of the report. The first point relates to establishment of special needs education schools. We will welcome the committee's recommendation to establish regional schools focusing on special needs education and inclusive education. I, however, wish to remind the other here that he, some 10 years ago, his excellency president in his re election manifesto promised to construct 10 regional schools in the original colonial districts of Ghana. Up to now, these have never been constructed. Only two have been constructed and there's the balance of 14. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I beg, I implore the Minister of Social for Education, I implore you, on Minister, kindly ensure that we have these schools captured in the budget for the next financial year. Second, and very exciting, the recommendation of employment of sign language interpreters by the Public Service Commission. The committee is correct to make an observation that we cannot achieve the principle of living no one blind without having sign language interpreters. We have more than one million persons in this country. They cannot access the courts of law. They cannot access the police. They cannot access the services. Therefore, this is the time for us to stand firmly at parliament and say, please, Minister of Public Service, we need to fight find this issue captured in your budget frame of papers for the next financial year. That one speaker, I need to point out that uh, special needs and inclusive culture. Because it's very important if you are to have the goals of special needs and culture. Work on this policy was concluded, but it has remained stagnant in public. I appeal to the Minister of Education, please have this item included on the agenda of cabinet and we get our policy approved so that it can be implemented. Other point, Raton Speaker, is about our role as parliament. Our role as parliament and the rule, Sabur 4, Sabur 4, of rule 183, state and The Committee on Equal Opportunities shall report to the House at least twice a year. I will need to repeat. The Committee on Equal Opportunities shall report to the House at least twice a year. We made this rule because we know these matters are very important. These issues of opportunities are very important. Right on speaker, I'm not sure if we got any reports in the first session of this parliament. I'm not sure. But there is here, we should be getting artists too. So, right on speaker, I beg you. I beg you to get the committee and to ensure that we debate these issues at least twice a year. Be able to highlight these issues and see that you can push for implementation. Thank you, Honorable. That's the right on speaker and very important. Right now, the government has a program, it's called rationalization, government departments. Under the idea of rationalization, the government has proposed to abolish or to merge the Equal Opportunities Commission. We are very, very, very right. We must not support in this country because the Equal Opportunities Commission is a constitutional body charged with taking a leading role in implementation of the principles of property function and coordination of opportunities. If this commission is established, we must not support will be in danger. This is an existential threat for us. 
I do not think that I'll be proud of calling myself a Ugandan once this commission is abolished. So, Honorable Speaker, I beg to ask you to ask our government, bro, to speak. Can we have a, a clear commitment from the government to the effect that there are no plans whatsoever to abolish the equal of this commission? The nation knows. If the government intends to retain the Equal Opportunities Commission, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Ndezi. I gave a special preparing, a special treatment to Honorable Ndezi because of his experience and situation on these issues. So, colleagues, the rest of you, two minutes. I mentioned your names, starting with Napak. <laughs> Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I wish to thank the committee for the excellent job. And as a representative of the people of NAPAC, I agree with the numbers the committee has, has put, the, the issues they have raised. It is true. I only wish to add um, the recommendations on education and health. Concerning access to a school, a secondary school, we know there is government plan to put up secondary schools, but it will take a while before the schools come. To save those students who cannot access a secondary school, I recommend that we allow the existing government-aided schools to operate day schooling so that the students who cannot afford a boarding facility beyond the issues of boarding, they can access, as, attend as day scholars. We open it up, the, the existing. On the issue of health, we have two sub-counties that don't have any health facility of any level, not even health center, two. And people have been dying there in their big numbers. I recommend that we prioritize those sub-counties, not only in NAPAC, in every part of this country that doesn't have a health facility. We prioritize those, the Ministry of Health, to prioritize those health sub-counties in the implementation of the VHT program, so that there is... Thank you, Honorable Karik. Thank you. I would like to thank the committee for its uh, report, which I believe is, has covered quite a number of issues. I'll briefly talk about three. One, in their committee, they talked in their recommendation, they talked about the youth venture capital fund uh, that it should be reviewed. That uh, it should be reviewed, but I think this venture capital fund, youth venture capital fund, has now been taken to the parish development board. So it is something I think we need to look at and see how we can press it. Secondly, right on the speaker, the committee talked about the high dropout rate of uh, students. Right on the speaker, I think the Minister of Education should actually carry out a clear research and investigation as to why there is a high dropout rate of, of children. When you look at uh, the intake of primary one, they are in a million. When they reach at four at senior four, they start reducing. When where they were eight million, they now become two million. You wonder where the two million have gone. Mm -hmm. When it comes senior six, they're in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. Like this year, I think it is two hundred and fifty-six students who are going to sit senior six against the eight million that started in P1. Where did the rest of the students go? I think the Minister of Education should carry out a thorough research and find out why so that the solution can be solved. But one speaker, on the transport issue, I would like the Ministry of, of Works to call out a deliberate research on the hard to reach road network areas. For example, they talked about Boezu. There's a very big problem of Boezu because of its nature. Construction, constructing of roads in Boezu is not easy and it becomes very expensive, I think, for government. So a deliberate consideration should be made by government, construct the road. Thank you. Uh, you. You know, like on that issue of roads, 
if if and you look at the nature of the rift valley and you say the district should be in charge of road <laughs> you you wonder what you're talking about really so you you wonder what you so now the the burden has shifted to me and you find i don't have a, any single government a central government road they are all under local government now the local government leaders say ah the speaker is the one who appropriates money <laughs> so that's 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 the situation you, you know that's the kind of situation and we are going into rains and uh uh i don't know if i mean and you know we are going into rainy seasons ensure that every day we are having plenary here there is a minister of works because a minister of works and minister for disaster these are the questions you're going to be getting every day but we can prevent this because what is important are not the words we get here it's, that's why we are pushing finance can you release money to the road fund which is a constitutional matter this is the fund protected by the constitution the the attorney general guided the crack ensure uh you put on the order paper link starts there next week we wanted an update on the implementation of the road fund huh? as committed by the minister here because the attorney general guided he said the road fund is protected by the constitution so minister you don't have any discretion of saying you you, you aggregated into other money that is part of the consolidated fund that one the attorney general guided properly here so let's please let's uh have it uh on tuesday on the order paper of tuesday the minister of finance should give us an update on the different funds that are protected by the constitution on a on the issue of uh, on the issue of merging eco opportunities commission let's allow government to do their work after they will come here because it's a constitutional body so the final say will be here as amending the law so it, it it will be we shall coordinate and we see how best we work on the executive so that we come out with a more feasible and acceptable uh, uh solution to that issue uh, then thank you. Then Christine. Then thank I you so much. Here, I come back here starting with the youth. Thank you so much, the Right Honorable Speaker. I, you, colleagues. I want to thank uh, the Eco Opportunities Commission for a report they have just presented for the Eco Opportunities Committee for this report. However, I want to make the following observations. That one, we have indigenous communities in Uganda that up to today are suffering just because they have never they were never included in the search schedule of the constitution of uganda the 1995 constitution and that they have lived in a total denial to the extent that they do not have national identity cards which is a prerequisite to social services delivery this matter was uh, handled here in the 10th parliament but not concluded I remember on the floor of parliament, I sought uh, leave of parliament to present a bill, which I did, but unfortunately, it was stayed with the purpose of waiting for the other holistic constitutional amendments. My request is that these people are still suffering. For example, the Meshopishek or Bennett, the Abagabo, Abakingwe, Bahaya, Maragori do not have identity cards they can't open bank accounts they can't secure their pieces of land if and several others so this position needs to be reviewed secondly we have people whose land was expropriated by government several years ago and up to today they have never been resettled never been compensated or otherwise i remember my senior honorable ellen kaunde Presenting him. Honorable Kaunde, you can complete his point. Thank you so much, Right Honorable Speaker. I also want to thank the committee for the work well done. 
I want to comment on uh, page 22, specifically on SEDGE. I want to agree with the committee's recommendation on reducing the age of the beneficiaries from 80 to 70, if it can even be further reduced uh, below 70, the better. Right Honorable Speaker and members, uh, you are aware that uh, much as the life expectancy in Uganda st stands at the age of 64, very few of our people live to celebrate the 80th, the 80th birthday. So it's very important that if government have resources, they should consider reducing the age of the beneficiaries to 70 years and even much below. Right Honorable Speaker and members, it is also true that during the registration exercise for the National Identity Card, many of the elderly people could not remember the exact dates of when they were born. Most of them would give answers as we were born during the other time, during the war, when it was raining, and it was at the discretion of the, the person who was in charge of helping them to register to guess by me looking at the physical appearance of that person. So when this exercise of supporting these elderly people started, many of them realized that actually they had uh, been born earlier than what was captured on the national IDs. And correcting this information on the national ID is very tedious, and most of our people have not been successful in correcting this information. Therefore, they are not benefiting. So if government can find a way of... That's a very serious issue, Honorable Member. I think, Honorable Minister, you need to take serious interest in it. It's all over the country. Uh, those ones who are not supposed to be benefiting, they are benefiting. They increased the age. Then the old ones who didn't have people tell them and what? Most of them, you say an old woman of 90, she's saying I'm 50 years. That's what the ID said and cannot get. So I think we need to use our, especially the leadership of the elderly people, since we have identify these people in the villages and we assist no yes uh kumi thank you very much right honorable speaker i am making a submission on the quota system i want to appreciate the government for this initiative and is really causing an impact in districts because of identification of the beneficiaries because if you go down there, people think that it is the local government leaders who identify the beneficiaries. My plea is that the process continues as it is because it makes people understand that the genuine beneficiaries are the ones who get that offer. However, on the loan scheme, Mr. Speaker, it is very true that information about it normally reaches the districts very, very late. And there is limited information that is given and mr speaker you know that for a beneficiary to succeed he or she has to pass through centenary bank if possible the process would entirely be under the district and districts have time through the airtime of the rdc's to go on radio and tell people in the district when they can apply for this scheme mr speaker districts also need to be a uh, guide uh, uh, on a member, the, the issue of the loan scheme, I think the biggest challenge has been even the amount we are giving these people. We are not giving them money. We are just giving them peanuts. It's very, very, not even if we say how much they got. And you see what is painful? You find... A student of uh, Namagunga, Kisubi, is on government sponsorship. The fees they do pay per term is higher than the money they pay at Makiriri. So, whom does government sponsorship benefit? Oh no, Minister, this is something you need to go and look at deeply. And maybe we put that money either under district quota system so that we benefit this uh, poor district or, or on a scheme you, you can share. Uh, uh, as uh, otherwise, yeah, oh, Sarah has reminded me part of what she, she presented. 
Because, because in reality, I've been a member of Makari University Council. When you to admit, you're admitting children of the rich. Then you can get another mechanism of why should Tayoga's child go on government sponsorship? For God is sake, why? Why? That, that's being really. Huh? That's a, well, people can say it's bright. To me, the issue of being bright should be determined on courses, which they can do. But also on some of these courses, you need to do affirmative action. How come in parliament you did affirmative action and a child who studied from mitoma, from primary one up to what is a deputy speaker? Didn't you appreciate me? <laughs> Yeah. If you give us chance, we can survive and reach here. But if you keep suffocating these young children, it's going to be a problem. Uh, anyway, uh, Ona Sara has reminded me the, the, the anticipation rule, rule 80, applies to me because there is emotion, but it's something one of the I need to look at deeply. And no, no I'm going to allow you, Corinne. I'm going to give you your time, okay? So, uh, uh, yeah. wow, there are members who have been here since we started and have not spoken. Yes. So, if you know you've already spoken, first, uh, I know this is a different. I'm having uh, uh, leaders of this side to go that side. Uh, wow, well, I, I, I'll pick engineer, I'll pick, uh, I'm seeing uh. On a Wakaba Sharira, then you think it's uh, wow, no, can I my ingo? Okay, Mukono. Oh, chair education, uh, shadow minister will give you a chance. Let's first speak those on. And Mama, Thank you. Mama, you know the time I pick you. Hmm? Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Yes. Right Honorable Speaker, I wish to appreciate the committee for the work well done. But uh, I think the report did not cover equity in recruitment, particularly in public service. Uh, Right Honorable Speaker, while well, as, uh, well, as uh, we appreciate the Ministry of Health standards in uh, putting at least a primary school in every parish and a secondary school in uh, every sub county, particularly to sub counties in urban centers, urban areas. For instance, Nakawa Division, which is referred to as a, a sub-county, has over 500,000 people. 500. And there are sub-counties that have even 10,000. So you cannot, basically, we cannot use the same parameters. How I wish we could begin using population in uh, making sure that we 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 alloc we give schools we allocate schools basing on population other than uh, basing on uh, the sub county because some of the sub counties we are actually small and therefore do not fit. I also want to appreciate Parliament, right, one of the speaker, when I we are paying tribute to the foreign speaker. I requested Parliament to recruit one of us, a little person called. Yubu, and to date as I speak, Yubu was employed by Parliament. I want to appreciate you for that great. Naomi, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I also want to thank the committee for a good job. But Mr. Speaker, I would like to be educated on what equal opportunity. What is it? Do I understand it or it has lost either meaning? Or I don't know. I need to be educated on what it means. Because in Ntungamo, we have 570, the population now stands around there. 
when you go to Mitoma district, I think it's like 190 or 200 there. When you go to Kota, Mitoma will get 80, Ntunga will also get 80. So how do we, how shall we measure that? That equal opportunity, how do we do it? That's why I ask that what does it mean? Because we get uh, the same. When it goes to even local government, still Mitoma will be given We are crying on the roads in Mitoma. I wish you could come to Ntungam. Ntungam will serve the same one unit as Mitoma. We have six constituencies. Double. So what is this, uh, Mr. Speaker? I need the committee also to look into that and sort and sort us. Then when she talked of the international and the national uh, days, uh, I would suggest that Actually, we just recognize these international days without wasting this money. I call it waste because people go to sit, talk, and do what. And then the national days, like Women Day, it is always a burden only to women. Why don't we leave it to the district and the money is just sent? This money which the ministry use, send it to the districts and give it to these women and then they. Thank you, Namaingo. Thank you so much, Right Honorable Speaker. I want to take this opportunity to appreciate the committee for the report. However, as chairperson of Uganda Parliamentary Forum for Children, I'm not seeing my children catered for in this report because children are our, our inheritance and the future generation. If we miss out to look at how we can protect this child, then it means that the future is not fit for us or we shall miss it out. Right, Honorable Speaker, this house gives 0.01% of the resources to child protection in this country. And that money is very little for us to protect the children. And that is why we are seeing the law enforcement officers across the district, across the country, they are all suffocating because they do not have resources to fight for the rights of our children. I want to pray and ask this house that we should give a conditional grant to the child protection unit so that we can at least fight for our future generation. Because when you talk of all benefiting from OVCs, when you look at children and youth that are put together and the money is put together, but most of it, goes to the youth. So why should we plan and invest in the youth and leave out the children whom we should target, target first at the primary moment so that at least by the time they become youth, then they're in a position to maybe do something meaningful for themselves. So I want to ask the Equal Opportunities Committee to put clear and also recommend that we give a conditional grant to child protection structure so that. Dr. Banaka. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to appreciate and thank those that put together that room. For us in the cities, we want to request that policies which awards be serviced as sub counties in terms of education. The population is high. And we are left out when it comes to secondary education. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, I've heard in the report, it is reported that we our population is around 40. This has created problems recently when the president was giving our, us information that we elevated to the middle class. Uh, the internationals, they are saying we are 47, 48. I want to request that the you boss be given funds and us to do a population census so that we base our planning not on just those experiments on the actual population so that we will know the, the categories uh, for instance the people with disability and it will help us in the planning purposes but we are estimating when will you both do the right population census so that it can guide us in our planning i submit mr speaker thank you uh, Mukono, was Mukono next? 
Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the committee for its report. However, I want to also concur, but I also have amendments to this effect. One, I want to talk about the mode of payment to be simplified because these elderly people are still very far and given their age, say 80 or and above or 75, I guess they could receive money on their phones to simplify the to to simplify their movement to going and collecting money from those centers they are supposed to get money from. Secondly, I also want to talk about um, we have money in areas. I ask the government to be directed to pay up to date and also includes the amount of money given to those people. Thirdly. I also want to talk about um, increment on youth livelihoods, some money to even away such that it can properly be utilized to their satisfaction. Thank you so much. I submit. Thank you. Uh, no, UP, I haven't seen any person of UPC speaking, so I will allow. UPC. <laughs> Thank you. Not former, but we... <laughs> current Santa. <laughs> Never Santa. Ru. Thank you so much, uh, Right Honourable. Right Honourable, allow me yeah. to join my colleagues in thanking the Eco Opportunity Committee uh, in coming with a, a very good report. Right Honourable Speaker, Eco Opportunity addresses the issue of marginalisation imbalances and discrimination in our country and how i wish they should frequently come with this report right honorable speaker uh, i remember at one time when we were sitting as the appointments committee we had a complaint with the issue of recruitment and uh, i have not seen it captured here whereby more especially the children of the poor normally don't get the right and the same opportunity with others. Not only that, right, Honorable Speaker, I want to applaud them for making a very important recommendation on the social assistance grant. I want to support them by saying that really, indeed, right, Honorable Speaker, the women, when you want to look for the women at the age of 80, you don't find them right, Honorable. Oh, I wish the government should take up upon this, the Minister of Gender the women are not there, and if this age could be reduced to 65, right, Honorable Speaker, many women will, but also the children and many others. Then finally, right, Honorable Speaker, I want to mention the issue on education, whereby you find that when the results come back, the marginalized communities and the rural uh, schools are the ones trailing behind. They have recommended on textbook, but I want to go further to really uh, add that the computers, even the computers, must be given to these uh, rural schools so that when we want to look. Mom Cecilia Gua. Thank you. There is another report coming. I'm, I'm taking note. I'm allowing another report, and I know colleagues you're going to submit. It will also be marketable like this one. So I'm taking note properly. No, I'm coming this side. I'm still here. You see, when I was this side, this side was not complaining. Please allow me. Thank you, Right Rumble Speaker. Right Rumble Speaker, I want first of all to use a few seconds of my time to congratulate the government chief whip who has appeared as a chief whip today so i want to appreciate that at least now we have um the real chief whip in the house because he has always been or she has always been represented today we uh, i appreciate the report and uh I'm happy about the few items that have been raised. But right, Honorable Speaker, let's address 
the critical issues of equal opportunity. And it is important that that committee must first study um, chapter four of the constitution because equal opportunity act is anchored on chapter four. And therefore we need to highlight where are, are we fallen short? Protection of the poor, protection of the, of the vulnerable, and also uh, to prevent deprivation. Uh, land grabbing is rampant in the country. How have you addressed it? How have you addressed the issue of land grabbing? Because that's deprivation. That's a critical issue. And right, Honorable Speaker, I know that uh, Parliament did a good job. Shadow Ruero, Shadow Minister of Education. Um, I thank you, right, Honorable Speaker. And I will limit myself to the education issues. First of all, And also, I advise the Minister of Education that according to the issues arising here, we need to revise the policy in regards to allocation of scope. Uh, as they've cited population, distance, I would give an example. In Bukasa here, that's back in the division, you realize we have one government school. But when you look at the population, it's very big, and that means that majority of the poor urban kids cannot access education. Either they fall out or they don't go to school. So the policy new mapping should be done because population is not static, it's changing all the time. So you need to be mapping all the areas all the time so that you can be able to provide quality education to all Ugandans. I um, I thought this report would also capture um, um, accessibility in regards to pre-primary education, especially in the rural areas, because we needed to know if the young rural learners are actually accessing, because it's part of the foundation. And it's lacking. I hope in the next reports, you'll be able to actually do a study that area. Right on able speaker, when it comes to the students run scheme, this scheme is limited, ring first for STEM subjects at degree and uh, diploma level, uh, meaning that uh, like certificate, most of the poor who actually fall out of school because they cannot accept Taka. Thank you, right honorable speaker. And uh, I request you just grant me one minute because ever since you sat in that seat, this is my first time to speak today. So I take the opportunity to congratulate you. I also thank you and all colleagues who were able to reach out to me when my life was in danger. Thank you very much. Today is the first day I've come back to Parliament. I'm now in good health. Thank you, all of you. Uh, you really stood with me. Thank you so much. Right Honorable Speaker, I would like to thank the chairperson and all members for the report that you have presented to us. And all the issues that you have mentioned, because they are all touchy, I would like to say that uh, we need to, to take time and have a comprehensive debate on how we can create a balance in this country to hold the hands of the disadvantaged so that the person who is deep in the deepest village of this country, I'll take an example of Obudaya sub-county in my district, can access the same education, the same health, 
the same service so that we don't have people moving to the urban the urban Uh, thank you so much, uh, Right Honourable Speaker. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Chair and the Committee for the report. And I recommend that the report be adopted. Right Honourable Speaker, I have one issue about to the non-communicable diseases. The equal opportunities caters for imbalances in this country. And we have people with chronic illnesses like diabetes, pressure. But in the health sector, such people are not given an opportunity to receive treatment at all health centers. The treatment is restricted mainly to hospitals and the national or regional referral hospitals. And this treatment is very expensive, right, Honor Speaker? somebody to be treated for diabetes or pressure has to pocket and get a lot of money if i would recommend that uh, such people the services and the drugs be given to these people they are referred to other levels uh, for treatment right on a speaker i thank you Okot Bonifa. Right, Honorable Speaker. I want, to salute, I want to salute uh, the Committee on Equal Opportunities for uh, on, uh, uh, Colleagues, just take heart. Our rules are very clear. Tell you a member of a committee, you cannot submit on the business of the committee. So, I, I have your names here, and I know you. So, colleagues, please don't feel bad. Don't say I'm refusing to give you an opportunity. That's our rule. So, Honorable Okot. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. I take this opportunity to salute the committee on equal opportunities for this elaborate report. However, Right Honorable Speaker, this report makes mention and recommendations to sector social sector development programs that are proposed for collapse and transfer to the parish development model. Uh, two cases in point, the Youth Livelihood Program and uh, Europe for Women. I think it's very important, right, Honorable Speaker, that government rests our fears regarding the status of the Youth Livelihood Program and WEP. And I seek to make recommendations as follows. One, that uh, as a country, we must build a culture of not collapsing one program for another without a phase-out strategy. Because we are risking and doing the gains of all these programs that we continue to build. Secondly, that now that the parish development model has failed to kickstart, we oh, on I want to start, please. Uh, right on the speaker, don't, the reason I'm making this case. No, don't don't base your submission on that on parish model. Let's make your submission. Uh, right Honourable Speaker, yeah. the reason I'm making this case is that these programs are being collapsed to feed the parish development model. And as it stands now, we are probably going many months without the young people benefiting from the Youth Livelihood Program. Oh, conclude, I interfered with your time. And these young people are seeking because we have groups that have benefited from these programs. So we are saying that as we wait for the program to begin, can we, for the meantime, continue having these programs ongoing so that the young people benefit? Thirdly, right honorable speaker, 
I would want this house to offer the Minister for Gender time to share with this house all the social sector development funds that are available and share with us the status of these funds so that we can make our input so that young people who benefit from these programs are able to benefit in a manner that the members think is uh, we will we will benefit them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go to Honorable Tungo, Honorable Timuzigu. Then I can. Huh? So, oh, uh, Max Ochai was first. Yes, Max Ochai. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker, for this opportunity. I rise to make a comment on the report that's being discussed on the floor, specifically on the affirmative action in the education sector. Mr. Speaker, sir, the committee produced a comprehensive report. However, on affirmative action in the education sector, I would like to add that in addition to the recommendation of ensuring that there is universal access to the loan scheme. In my view, that recommendation assumes that Uganda is homogeneous, which unfortunately is not the case. In that respect, therefore, I thought that the committee could have also thought outside the box and factored in grant and bursaries to take care of those who are financially needy but are in position to acquire higher education. In that respect, therefore, my recommendation would be to amend or to add to the recommendation of the report that grants be given, or bursaries for that matter, be given to those who are from very, very poor backgrounds and as long as they have got the capacity and the will to study. I thank you. Thank you. Navi Tungo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So speak, I want to use one minute to congratulate my brother, Honore uh, Obua, who has been our minister as a, a member of education and sports. We have supported him and he has performed as a minister because Uganda is now on the map because of the performance of athletes. My brother, congratulations. Uh, number two, I want to talk about the loan scheme. We have had issues of their own scheme concerning the arts students. This scheme is a scheme for science students. And the science students are students who go to first schools. So when you are in Wudo and you get 18 and above, you go on the government, on the government scheme at Makere. The balance of 17 and 16 up to 13 who are, who are doing sciences at Wudo, they are the ones who apply and go for their own scheme. So the poor boy in the village without laboratories who has struggled to do arts, he cannot access this loan scheme. So our recommendation has been that one, let them open up. Whether you are doing sciences, where you are doing arts, after all it is a loan, you are all going to do what? You are going to pay. Number two, government should not waste time. Government is struggling with these government special students at universities with living out allowances. We have been seeing strikes. So our recommendation has been that get all the money which the government puts in the government so they can struggle and study. Otherwise, I want to thank the chairperson and the team for a good report. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Then Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I have interest in the committee chair, first committee chair, HIV. Because, you know, it's very important, the work they do is what is being commented on. And uh, uh, def uh, defense, defense, we have Karamoja, I wanted you on Karamoja issue. Okay. I had marked you here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I take this opportunity also to congratulate my brother. No, Honorable Sarah is giving me, Wopa, women MPs have spoken. For yes, women MPs have spoken. So. Uh -huh. Go on, Thank speak. you, Mr. Speaker. I congratulate my brother, Honor Oboa, for assenting to that office of Chief Whip. And I believe 
God is going to give you the courage and the capacity to do that job as usual. I thank the chairperson for delivering together with the committee on this report. My submission is about the community development officers. The committee recommends that we give them, the, the government supports them with the transport, facilitate the CDOs. It has been their complaint for so long. And at the end of the day, they end up charging the beneficiaries of the funds. And as we go on to implement parish model, it means that the, our people will be charged for the services for, from CDOs. And that is extremely dangerous. So therefore, we have to make sure that those CDOs are facilitated with the transport and even accommodation. Some, in some areas, they have to travel for so long. Secondly, there is an issue concerning some districts having no knowledge about youth capital venture fund, like NAPAC. This is extremely unfortunate that some districts don't, do not know about this program. But in addition to that, Mr. Speaker and the House, some youth do not know even the ventures to start. Money comes and they don't know the projects to, to start. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I'll, be, uh, I'll begin with the, uh, the social assistance that we're giving to the old, the old people. Chair, reduce uh, from 80 to 70 and for the women to 65. I want to think it's not proper for the committee that is working on equal opportunities to begin by discriminating gender. Secondly, Chair, uh, as we speak today, inflation is very high. Chair, I suggest that the committee uh, add minimum so on the issue of the loan scheme here if today we asked for a risk and you look at Busoga alone you may not even have 10 children from Busoga that have qualified for that scheme they apply Busoga is no, well known for doing sciences. It's on record. But not even plain. The system is very paramount in this case. Chair, so I want to employ the committee to look at the issue of salary discrimination. Dr. Yume? No. Uh, thank you very much, Right Honorable. I would want to thank the committee for their report. I just wanted to give information that uh, the government of Uganda continues to prioritize we have constructed 351 health center threes as government of Uganda. However, uh, right honorable speaker, sometimes creation of uh, new sub-counties outstrips the construction. So much as we have tried to achieve 351 in the last five years, more administrative units are being constructed, increasing the gap. And the average cost is anywhere between 500 to 900 million shillings for a maternity unit. Uh, I would also want to know which health center that is, where male and female are sharing wards cognizant of the fact that sometimes information districts take it upon themselves to repurpose some old administrative units into health facilities. But we have a standard as government, we have a standard as Minister of Health for what constitutes a ward, and it clearly separates male and female. 
Today on the issue of non-communicable diseases, we prioritize non-communicable diseases until the grassroots facilities. That is whether it is cancer, we are decentralizing to regional levels, and we also have drugs to health center, for health center threes for diabetes and uh, for heart diseases. We're also prioritizing health educators and health inspectors because we also think the prevention aspect is quite important. So I just wanted to give that information. Thank you. Chair HIV. I thank you very much, right honorable speaker. I want to thank the committee for the report. Right honorable speaker, I want to comment on uh, equal access to health in two areas. The first one is with our children who are suffering from hydrocephalus and spinal bifida. These are children who have got big heads, as we locally know it. But when I was speaker, these children accessing treatment is very difficult. In all our government hospitals, many of them do not handle these cases. And parents of these children find it very challenging to have treatment for their children. And they are always referred to private hospitals in Mbale, like Kiwa or Kiwa Jinja. And so I want to appeal to government that for us to have equal access to health, these children should be considered. Secondly, right honorable speakers, the chair for HIV and AIDS, during our uh, assessment, we have discovered that there is an increase in key population. And among these key populations, there is also increase of HIV and AIDS. But because of discrimination and stigma that is around what they do and what they believe in, they normally hide themselves and fail to access treatment. And if we are speaking about equal opportunities and there is an equal right to access to health, I think we need to look for a way that we can cater for these people. Lastly, right honorable speaker, is on equal distribution of resources. You talked here very well about your region, the terrain of your roads. I think you're mount, from mountainous area. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, colleagues have congratulated Indugo Bua. I've got regards. Indugo Bua went through a secondary school where Right Honorable Kadaga started from. So she has asked me to convey her regards and comments to Honorable Bua since she's <laughs> right. Honorable Speaker, my thing is simple. There are two areas. One, the city school is right. Honorable school, right. Honorable Speaker, are given to a sub county. There are sub counties, right. Honorable Speaker, with one, with one parish. There are sub counties with three parishes. And there are sub counties with 10 parishes. But collectively, where the sub county has one parish, three parishes, or 10 parishes, they consider it as a sub county and they give it one CD school, which disadvantages most of these other students that we need to. Last, right honorable speaker, the chairperson talked about skilling Uganda. Right honorable speaker, the president began a program of skilling Uganda. Unfortunately, the program of securing Uganda right on the speaker only ended in Kampala here and the surrounding areas. Yet securing Uganda would benefit most of our people from Kamuli, from Karamoja, and from all these other areas of our country. Right on the speaker is an area that I request we take a note. If securing in Uganda has to hold the meaning of securing Uganda, can we have it also go up country? instead of ending in Kampala. It's only in the four divisions of Kampala, right, Honorable Speaker. So since the minister is here, the chairperson has hinted something about it. We request that the minister and the, the, the members concerned have securing Uganda move up country to help those disadvantaged members. Thank you, right, Honorable. Thank you, Karangara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to, to thank the committee for the work well done. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they talked about um, their 
my captain talked about uh, distribution of resources fairly. When we come to uh, payment of the staff or civil servants, Mr. Speaker, Kalangala district is an island district. But when they hear, I think when they hear Kalangala Town Council, they think it is in Kampala somewhere. Kalangala Town Council members of staff or uh, civil servants are given different allowances as compared to those in the deeper islands. Mr. Speaker, I think it would be fair for those in the Town Council of Kalangala to also receive uh, hard to reach allowances like the others do, because it is only those in the deeper islands that receive hard to reach. Yet these ones also travel on water to go and work. So I think it is unfair. It should be fair, fairly done. And also, Mr. Speaker, speaking about poverty, on page 24, they talked about poverty and insecurity, but the committee did not give us um, recommendations. I don't know why, but I think one of the recommendations that should be done, uh, we should reinstate YLP, UEP, and uh, SEDGE to ensure that the poor people are reached. You see, when, when we talk about um, my, 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 our, our good minister here has visited Kalangala, Mr. Kasolo, and he has taught our people as regards to a mioga. But the microfinance, uh, microfinance center, the funds we got from there. <coughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, just a minute. No, honorable colleague. It's, a, it's very clear. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, right on our speaker. My name is Katsime Anet Mutsha, woman member of parliament, Ushen district. Right on our speaker, allow me to thank the chairperson of the committee for the comprehensive report. Fortunately, I was in Ushen when they visited the district and moved with them in different institutions. Uh, right on our speaker, allow me to put emphasis on schools for people with disabilities. Uh, right on our speaker, we have very few schools for people with disabilities. However, those schools are not taken, they are not given a priority. For example, they have talked about the school in Ushen. The iron sheets are very old. They are even leaking. The structures are disappointing. I want to ask the Honorable Minister, with due respect, take an, an, a, 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 pro, a proactive approach and send there these technocrats to look at the, those structures. Otherwise, this is a started raining, a calamity is going to happen. I want to assure you that these schools are in bad state. With due in Ushen only and see the situation and attend to those schools. I thank you, Right One, our speaker, for giving me the opportunity. Oshabe? Right One, our speaker, thank you very, very much for giving me the opportunity. Right One, our speaker, I am happy that you've given me chance because I've had everyone thanking the committee, but I am one of the, those disappointed. And thank you for allowing my voice to come through. Uh, why am I disappointed, Right Honorable Speaker, in the committee report? Right Honorable Speaker, this committee is not a sectoral committee that is supposed to go reporting on, on everything, even reaching the point of reporting on latrines. This committee should be a policy committee. Right, Honorable Speaker, in every sector, they should show us how government have uh, streamlined matters of equal opportunities for those people that you're looking at. But right, Honorable Speaker, they're here talking about their twins, they're already talking about something, they are all over. Yet there are specific committees, right, Honorable Speaker, that are responsible for reporting on those sectors. I'll give an example, right, Honorable Speaker. On the matter of loan scheme, just pick your, your, your report and read what they've given to us. 
they should have told us that the loan scheme, this is what they've done to ensure that equal opportunity is given to all Ugandans. Then they tell us what they advise them to do to ensure that equal opportunities reach to everyone. But they are here telling you only in this list to one person, the other one, one person. I think this committee can do better, right on our speaker, by going on all sectors, looking at every sector and seeing how imbalances can be cured. Honorable Minister of Gender, no colleagues, Honorable Minister, responses. And uh, please keep this short because we shall expect a report. Thank you. Uh, uh, Minister, before you, Rob has requested. Make some remarks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I will commence with the, the formulation of the uh, policy on special needs. Because uh, I'm one of those about to receive a petition from special needs teachers after salary enhancement of sciences. They are complaining bitterly because... You, you are about to. Yeah, I'm about to. So you're after. working together. You have. They have. They have already reached out to okay, me. Okay. <laughs> yes, and uh, that policy is uh, dragging feet. It has taken long, mm -hmm. and uh, I think um, government should expedite the ministry uh, formulation of that policy. Uh, in the ministry of public service, it is a thirty percent hard to reach fund. And the number of districts, including that of Ududa, uh, were beneficiaries, supposed to be beneficiaries of this fund. And uh, issues of marginalized groups in hard to reach areas like Ududa would uh, actually uh, be benefiting from, from this fund. But up to now, implementation of this has taken ages, and uh, we don't seem to be seeing and uh, funds coming to those that are, have been waiting for ages in the shortest time possible. You know very well, I've, uh, I've just seen the teacher to pupil ratio in a park at uh, 1 to 91. But if you come to places like Ruda, where about five schools were closed because they are in places that are surrounded with cracks, the ratio is even worse, is 1 to 100, 150 pupils. The speaker, the planning for this uh, affirmative program projects is very poor. And they are designed in such a way that they are mere token packages, but not for empowerment, because we don't see any capacity or capabilities being built out of. Uh, uh, these programs. They come at in and the recipients treat them like they are political tokens. And that's why you find they had uh, their fruit. Even they are highly partisan. You are aware, Mr. Speaker, that uh, their DCs and uh, Chairman NRM are the ones that are normally in charge of this affirmative action programs and that's why they end up being abused mr speaker with the the, the loan scheme the truth of the matter is that the northern go on, look. were mentioned how do and uh, through you mr speaker you are chair seek your indulgence to have a list of the beneficiaries of this loan scheme furnished to this house so that we know yeah regionally so that we know who these beneficiaries are because some of those from the northwest come and benefit from the through the east so please through your office let this house be furnished with a list of the beneficiaries of this loan scheme thank you mr speaker Thank you. Uh, um, I, I hope the intention is not knowing who is where. I remember when we were at campus, we had, uh, and he's a senior police officer now, called Biaranga Odu. 
Yarango Dur, we had a situation where one senior politician on the opposition attacked him when they were in Guru, saying, uh, now, you know, benefiting on things of their choice. And for it to turn out that Yaranga couldn't even speak a Gandhi. He was a true Achori. And uh, that person was a senior leader here. I remember the embarrassment of following a name. They followed just Yaranga, not knowing he's dealing with his Achori brother, whom he was about to slaughter. Kumbe, it was an Achori. Now that uh, I know many Bagisu, I, I, I've seen. We have uh, Honorable Wanda Richard there. The Nyankore, he speaks, some of us cannot speak it. When you hear him speak, you will slaughter him as a Nyankore. But he's a senior Mugisu who passed through him. So, so some of these things we have to be cautious, colleagues. <laughs> when, but it's very important the list should be presented. So that uh, it's verifiable. There is nothing to hide. So Honorable Minister, please present that list. So that can be referred to the committee uh, for education, so that members can be able to verify it. It's very, very important. Honorable Minister, uh, Honorable Minister, maximum five minutes. Thank you. you right, Honorable. I want to thank the committee for the observation and the recommendation contained in their report. The issues raised. Uh, social services, which captured the issue of uh, poor delivery, uh, inadequate uh, access by vulnerable communities and groups, issues of the loan scheme and accessibility, and issues of um, how people should access in a balanced way. Uh, I've noted all this. As Equal Opportunities Commission, you are aware, its role is to ensure balanced development, balanced access to services, equal opportunities for everybody in recruitment, in placement, and all the other services in the government. We are going to study the report of the committee with members of the Equal Opportunity Commission and we'll be able to report to Parliament on the detailed issues that have been raised in the report and from members of Parliament. We note issues raised in respect to ethnic minorities, which the Equal Opportunities Commission has visited, has compiled, has made recommendation on how each of these should be dealt with, including issues of access to identity cards. And it was discussed yesterday in cabinet, how issues of those ethnic minorities and those not in the constitution should uh, be addressed in the current exercise, which is about to begin. I've noted issues of grants and financial support programs for the vulnerable groups, issues of SAGE, where Parliament requires age lowering, increase in the amount, payment of the areas. I have noted that. We have, as a ministry, assessed all the implication of the financial requirements if we lower the age to 75, to 70, to 65, to 60, uh, if we increase from 25 to 30, up to 50,000, but in our obtain, if we are to lower at 70 years and increase to 50 years. We are discussing this, and we are going to make recommendation to cabinet, youth livelihood program, OEP, Youth Venture Capital Fund, the Persons with Disability Grants, the Enterprise Fund for the Elderly, all these funds, issues that have been raised by my colleagues, members of parliament, have been noted. We are going to discuss, but I want to assure you that these 
grants those that are in existence the affirmative action grants are based on clear guidelines there is no prejudice in respect to access that's why i see that all the members of this august house from both sides have appreciated have contributed and have requested and made proposals on measures to make sure either they are scaled up or the increase uh, in accessibility so there is no issue of saying people access it based on party on issues of poverty the issues of discrimination inequalities imbalances that have been raised in the report again these are issues that have been studied by the equal opportunities commission they have reports annual reports in each of these sectors and right honorable speaker i will present the annual reports here so that there is more scrutiny of all the issues that have been raised here the special needs education issues related to um, uh, areas and all the issues raised are contained in the annual report of the committee uh, of the equal opportunities and i will be able to bring the report here so that there is more study on that otherwise right honorable speaker i want to thank colleagues for their interest and support in respect to how to entrench legal policy guidelines standards of living of the vulnerable groups and ensure that we address issues of inequality i thank you Thank you, Honourable Minister. For reason, I now put the question that the report of the Committee on Eco Opportunities on the State of Eco Opportunities in Selected Sectors and Affirmative Action Programs be adopted. Those in favour say aye and oh, with amendments. Those in favour, let me repeat it for clarity. No, Honourable Ministers, this report was touching very many areas. The Minister of Gender is going to coordinate other ministers. This is a multi-sectoral report. So the Minister of Gender is going to coordinate other ministers to ensure that recommendations are implemented and responses are prepared. Otherwise, every minister, if they have come here to respond, will take really a very long time. Uh, now, I put the question that the report of the Committee on Equal Opportunities and the State of Equal Opportunities in Selected Sectors and affirmative action programs be adopted with amendments. Those in favor say aye, and the contrary nay. The ayes have it. Um, Honorable Chair of the committee, thank you uh, for your report. But I want you to go back. You look at uh, Rule 183, Sub Rule 3, uh, Sub Rule 4. You are supposed to report twice on this floor. Rule 18. And in the last session, this is the report for the last session. We expect you to prepare a report uh, for the next session. So we expect you, these reports, to come in time so that we can indeed uh, do handle them. Now, Minister, as per Rule 220 of our Rules of Procedure, you are required to bring an action taken report uh, within three months. Please link up with all sectors and crack, kind extract all action taken reports which the ministers are supposed to bring here so that we don't always pass resolutions in vain. When we pass resolutions, people go and rest and yet action is supposed to be taken. So I need you to extract all resolutions we made, all reports adopted so that we can have uh, action taken reports submitted here. Uh, item number six. Oh. Item number six. Chair, Thank, you, Thank you, Right Honorable. I will do as you have guided. Thank you. The motion item. for adoption of the report of the Committee on Defense and Internal Affairs on Field Visits to Government Prisons and Prison Farms. Honorable uh, Chair, Committee on Defense and Internal Affairs.
Thank you, Voice. Uh, Chair, you have scripted 20 minutes. Go on observations and recommendations. Thank okay. you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Honorable members, this is a report of the Committee on Defense and Internal Affairs on field visits to government prisons and prison farms. Right Honorable Speaker, permit me. Okay. Honorable, those are in the report. Just uh, go on observation and recommendation. So that we can have time for debate. I want every colleague who has not spoken to speak. Thank you very much. Right now, speaker. Five point one, which is congestion and overcrowding in prisons. The committee noted that overcrowding is an outstanding problem to the prison management in the country. Congestion is an average is an average of three three nine percent with some prisons housing above five times their designed housing capacities in detail, as detailed below. Right on speaker, that is tabulated, and we made reference to some of the prisons, like Obushen, Barara, Masindi, Chiruhura, Lira, Rukunjiri, Ndorwa, Tachika, Fort Poto, Kitugum, Busheng, Masaka, Saza, then upper prison. The committee observed that overcrowding in prisons relates to challenges in the judicial system. For instance, shortage of judicial staff, prosecution officers, investigators, missing of court files, and a few high court sessions. In addition, unnecessary adjustment, adjustments by judges greatly negate the trial process by cases dragging on in courts for a long time leading to high number of unconvicted offenders in prison custody who eventually contribute to the rise of population in prisons. The committee further noted that another cause of congestion in prison institutions in the country is the presence of large number of prisoners who have been sentenced to death over the years but have not, never been executed. This growing prison population has overstretched existing physical facilities and puts pressure on services like water leading to unhygienic conditions. The committee noted, noted that delivery of justice is a coordinated process in the just law and order sector where departments within the sector have to be aligned and coordinated simultaneously to perform all activities in the process. The committee also noted that in some prison facilities like Katojo Prison, Kabarol District, juveniles were imprisoned together with adults instead of remand homes, thereby increasing congestion in the prison. However, members were informed that this was as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, where prisoners were restricted to particular facilities to avoid spread of COVID-19. Recommendations. Prison service development budget should be increased to enable rehabilitation, expansion, and construction of more prisons to accommodate the increasing number of prisoners and reduce on congestion in the available facilities. Two, courts of law should employ alternatives to imprisonment, such as community service, suspended sentence, and affordable fines to ensure that petty offenders do not congest prisons. The advisory committee on the prerogative of mercy, whose task is to advise the president as per section 121 of the constitution should make recommendations regarding death penalty. Given that since 1999, no executions have been carried out, yet more prisoners have been sentenced to death. Government should appoint more judges and magistrates to increase on the frequency of court sessions as a way of reducing backlog of cases. In line with the law, remand whose cases lack sufficient evidence should be given bail as prosecution gathers more evidence. Government should develop the national corrections policy 
to guide the transformation from penal to productive corrections. Community participation should be promoted in corrections and involvement of the private sector and non-state actors in the offender reintegration process. Government should strengthen collaboration with actors in the criminal justice system to reduce the remand population. Two, the other challenge is to do with inadequate staff housing and accommodation. The committee observed that poor housing and working conditions of prison staff, especially those of the lower cadres, reduces their morale, thus are unable to fully dedicate themselves to working in such unbearable conditions. It is ironical to note that the same prison officers who are supposed to rehabilitate the prisoners suffer the same consequences as the prisoners. The committee observed that 7,121 staff, 50%, are not properly housed. Some prison staff still reside in uniports, canteens, makeshift structures, and others stay in houses roofed with asbestos sheets, which have been prohibited worldwide because of health dangers that they pose to inhabitants. The committee was informed that some prison officers spend part of their meager salaries on renting houses outside the barracks, while others who cannot afford are forced to stay with their families in congested, dilapidated structures. As modern social units are being created, some staff share houses which are quite small and cannot accommodate their families properly. This poor housing condition does not only infringe on the rights of prison officers, but also lowers their morale. The committee appreciated the ongoing construction and renovation of accommodation facilities in some few prisons. However, there's still a lot to be done to improve the accommodation facilities of prison officers. Recommendation. The committee recommends that prisons management should prioritize construction of low-cost housing units and phasing using the incremental approach as a multi-year project for decent staff accommodation. Yeah. Government should urgently provide the funds to replace asbestos sheets with the iron sheets because it is a health hazard to the occupants. The third challenge is mistreatment of prisoners. The committee was informed that deliberate physical and psychological, mistreat psychological mistreatment of inmates is a pervasive and persistent issue of concern. According to in inmates, pre-trial detainees are often at a risk of being mistreated because they are under the control of the detaining authorities who may perceive torture and other forms of ill treatment as the easiest and fastest way of obtaining information or extract confession. Other our officers in charge delegate representatives from among, among detainees to handle discipline issues on their behalf. These are the ones who in most cases mistreat fellow prisoners. Prisoners informed the committee that the common methods of torture and mistreatment included beating, reduction of food ratios, and denial of medical treatment. The committee recommends Human Rights Committee should follow up on the matter with the view of establishing more facts in relation to torture and mistreatment of prisoners. Two, as an institutional measure, prison authorities should strengthen the monitoring department to periodically interface with the inmates to identify issues that affect inmates. Prison officers in charge should play their role of supervision instead of delegating selected prisoners to discharge duties on their behalf. Challenge number four, 5.4, inadequate legal representation of prisoners. The committee observed that prisoners are faced with a challenge of legal representation because most of them are poor and do not afford to pay. To honor its obligation to provide legal services as its duty to provide it to criminal offenders. Just law and other sections
deeper conversation. How many teachers in Uganda did you consult? But there's a mistake we are making. Which is good. Which is good. Which is good. Which is good. We went to this school, we ran it to Western, <laughs> we ran it to Northern, we ran it, then you come. Is, well, isn't that an achievement? Objective and non-partisan. Honorable Minister, there were a number of points. I want to start with you. Straight from the hearts of open-minded men and women. Money tends to move faster at night. <laughs> so when, uh, when, when people are when not you, counting, what? Don't take it for granted. Candid and authentic. Because Uganda is not Thailand. That's that's not correct. And and we should stop that kind of mentality. So so what I'm what I'm that, saying that's is a um, trick question. Don't answer. I'm, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> I'm not getting into that. Um, Tell him you speak more. I think that's where we are beginning to have a problem. I think what is going to kill the parish model are all the misconceptions on how it's supposed to run. I know that the prime minister is listening. Behind the headlines. Charles, let us agree. We liberalized the economy. We are several nations put it together. Why, why don't you? Why don't you appreciate that? What if it fails? I'm happy. And to he's answer. a good lawyer because I mean he's not in the power. <laughs> yeah. The parish development committee is functional. It is there that there is a parish chief that the beneficiaries do exist. So we look at expenditure. We don't look at revenue, and that is the challenge we are giving them from Minister of Finance. Your fountain of new knowledge flowing into the mass body of knowledge. First get the knowledge of Bukedia, how they want to be modernized. Every Wednesday, 10 p.m. on your public broadcaster. You return money to the treasury, which is meant for the people. UBC, inspiring Uganda. This week on UBC. Looking at the role of the state as far as the economic growth of a country is concerned. We must appreciate that as Minister of Agriculture, we, we have a tall order. The population in the world is increasing. And unfortunately, our people are stuck in all the methods of production. The government has to include an enhanced focus that is on improving the productivity of agriculture. Uh, we have come up with strategies at all levels for the small order, for the medium and large scale farmers. We have achieved the middle income status and we need to demonstrate that actually we are there. It means that the people have disposable income to buy goods and services. They are, now, they are all in the money economy. It is entrepreneurs hub. next on UBC. Brought to you by Keep the lights on. Use Airtel money to pay for all your Yaka bills conveniently. Open the My Airtel app to buy Yaka units. Airtel money. Simple, secure, borderless. Hujambo mtazamaji wa UBC TV ifatai ni taarifa ya habari kutoka hapa mjini Kampala katika studio zetu za UBC TV naitwa Bela Masangano na kabla sijakupa taarifa kwa kirefu tupate muktasari wa habari kwanza wa Kenya. Maandalizi ya mkutano wa kilele wa Afro Indian Investment Summit yanafanyika. Na taasisi ya utafiti wa zao la migomba Burdk yatimiza miaka miwili ya kuundwa kwake.
Katika habari ya kwanza mgombea wa urais wa azimio la Umoja One Kenya Alliance Raila Odinga amevunja ukimya tangu kutangazwa kwa matokeo ya uchaguzi wa urais wa Agosti tarehe tisa hapo jana ambapo bwana William Ruto alitangazwa kuwa mshindi wa uchaguzi huo. Bwana Raila Odinga amepinga matokeo hayo kwa kusema kwamba kulikuwa na wizi wa kura. Sahi. Kutoa shukrani kwa Kenya wenzangu ambayo wameshiriki katika uchaguzi ambayo imepita. Wameonyesha ujasiri, wameonyesha uzalendo na upendo kwa nchi yao. Wa Kenya kile mahali walijitokeza wakapiga kura kwa njia ya amani. Na sasa yale ambayo yalibaki ni tume ya uchaguzi kuhakikisha kwamba ile ndoto ya wana Kenya imeheshimiwa. Tumegundua hitilafu ambayo imefanyika katika IBC ambayo imejaribu kutaka kukiuka yale ambayo wa Kenya wenyewe walikuwa wamefanya. Tumeona yale ambayo imefanywa na yule mwenyekiti wa tume ya uchaguzi bwana wa fula shebukati kwa kujaribu kupendua ili wamuzi ya wa Kenya anafanya hivyo bila kushauriana na wale wenzake ambaye wako pale pamoja na yeye katika tume ya uchaguzi sisi wana Kenya na wanaazimio tunapenda amani tunapenda umoja wa Kenya tunataka kuona kama wa Kenya maungana kama kitu kimoja ndio tunaongea juu ya azimio la umoja tuko na nia ya kuona kwamba Kenya imetoka katika janga la ufukara janga ya kutokuwa na imani na amani na janga ya ubaguzi ya kikabila ili wa Kenya waungane kama watu moja waweze kutekeleza wajibu yao kulingana na ndoto ya mwanzilishi wa taifa letu hatutakubali nataka kurudia hai hatutakubali mtu mmoja ajaribu kuleta vurugu katika taifa letu kujaribu vile vile kubadilisha yale ambayo wa Kenya wameamua kama watu mmoja wa Kenya hawatakubali hatutakubali tutazidi kutetea nchi yetu na katiba letu kama wa Kenya ili Kenya iweze kuendelea mbele asante ni sana Mungu ibariki Kenya nchi yetu Wizara ya ICT na mwongozo wa kitaifa inapendekeza kuwaanishwa kwa miswada yote katika mabadiliko ya kidijitali ambayo yatajumuisha marekebisho yote yanayopendekezwa katika wizara hiyo ili kuepuka kurudiwa akiwa mbele ya kamati ya kibunge ya masuala ya ICT maafisa kutoka wizara hiyo wakiongozwa na waziri Joyce Nabosa walishauriana na kamati hiyo kusiana na kustisha marekebisho ya miswada katika wizara hiyo kwa sasa yaliyopendekezwa na mbunge wa Kampala Muhammad Nsereko ili kuepusha sheria zisirudiwe rudiwe we have brought up the fact that you know some of the proposals in honorable muhammad's uh, amendment are already existing in certain laws so we want and then that would create more overlaps but now we are saying you know we want to create one whole encompassing bill within the just digital transformation space that can also incorporate honorable Zerico's suggestions so that we avoid duplication so that one encompassing bill that we are working on is called the information and communications bill so as soon as we have that it will be talking to everything the data protection and privacy the information uh, the computer misuse journalism act etc so that at the end of the day within the sector we avoid all the duplication that currently exists and not yet swallowing we are proposing that we have a halt on proceeding with this bill and we consider having a harmonized one so if we are, we are this is a consultative engagement we are talking to the members of parliament we are going to engage 
um, Honorable Nsereko, who is a mover of this bill, cabinet is also aware so that at the end of the day we harmonize our positions. My recommendation to the committee is that they should, uh, we should hold uh, discussions on the, the misuse amendment bill and wait for their bill which is uh, in cabinet. Uh, of course now that is their presentation to the committee. The committee is going to sit and deliberate on their request whether they should wait for them or we should proceed with the bill. That will be discussions after we've met the stakeholders this week. Nemo ni kubanga ya jireta tulina okoli ya wamu na yi. Tuja kutula na yi tulabenga tutambuli ya wamu. Tukirizi ganyi mubichi intubi yonai biba bieta agisa. Tulabenga biru ya fuevayo, ngane ya kiliza, alisasifaid ya jireta, ati ngane ministwe, na fwe tulisasifaid, mkubanti ya genda kutuko leda burongi. Raya nchini wameombwa kuondo kana na hofu na kujifunza tabia ya kuwekeza wakishirikiana na wageni wanaokuja nchini kuwekeza kulingana na taarifa wananchi wanaposhirikiana na wageni wanaokuja kuwekeza nchini wanajifunza mambo mengi na kufaidika pia na matumizi ya teknolojia haya alisemwa na waziri wa nchi wa masuala ya uwekezaji na ubinafsi, ubinafsishwaji Evelyn Anite katika kikao cha waandishi wa habari Kampala akiwaeleza kuhusu mkutano wa kilele ujao wa wawekezaji wa Kihindi na raia wa hapa nchini wa Afro Indian Investment Summit. Manufacturing that have developed they have accepted non-nationals to come to their country. So if you're going to be sectarian really we want to do this to fight against sectarian, sectarianism and really this time if there are Ugandans who are holding the properties of these departed Asians, between now and 28 we want to call upon them to return. Big people, I have not named the names that uh, the parliament is investigating having falsely taken these people's property. As we move towards celebrating this day, the directive is very clear, return their property because we want prosperity for our country. And between 1991 to date, UIA, or Uganda Investment Authority, has licensed investment projects from India worth 2.3 billion United States dollars. We shall also work with partner MDS uh, through the one-stop center for investors to ensure that within 48 hours, investors can access the requisite services, including permits and licenses required uh, to operate in Uganda. Because there is no restriction how to use our profits, the country is fine. If an investor makes a profit in Uganda, the investor can use profits anywhere they want. They can reinvest here or somewhere else. Wakulima nchini na kwenye mataifa ya Afrika Mashariki kwa ujumla wamehimizwa kupanda mazao yenye kukua na kuvunwa haraka wakati huu ambapo mabadiliko ya tabia nchi yanaendelea kuathiri shughuli za kilimo. Kilimo kwa kitalo nyumba kinahimizwa ili kuyakabili mabadiliko ya tabia nchi pia. Vile vile wakulima wanashauriwa kushiriki katika mipango ya kimaendeleo ya serikali hasa ule wa parish development model unaolenga kuwakwamua kiuchumi. Kamishna wa usimamizi wa raslimali watu katika wizara ya kilimo, mifugo na uvuvi Max Serembe alitoa ushauri huo wakati wa ufunguzi wa mafunzo ya siku nne kwa viongozi wanaosimamia mpango wa maendeleo ya vijiji wa SMU kutoka Burundi. Mafunzo hayo yanatarajiwa kubadili fikra potofu walionayo watu wengi kuhusiana na mipango ya kimaendeleo. Mafunzo hayo yakifanyika katika taasisi ya uongozi wa wakulima ya National Farmers Leadership Center Kampiringi sa wilayani Mpiji. Viongozi hao 41 kutoka Burundi wakiongozwa na mratibu wa mpango wa SMU wa Burundi Hatungimana Ezekiel. Pa Uganda kwenye NFRIC. Tumekuja hapa uh, kuchangia to share experience eh, na watu wa Uganda. Tumekuja hapa 
kuona gisi nchi ya Korea ilikuwa miaka ya kupita ilikuwa nchi maskini kama gisi nchi nyingi za hapa Afrika acha ni sema East Africa kwa sababu ni kwa Uganda unaoa Burundi na Uganda tuko mu East Africa miaka ya kale miaka 30 kupita hamsini nchi ya Uganda Burundi Tanzania uh, Kongo hata uh, Korea zilikuwa nchi maskini mm-hmm. lakini ukilinganisha na leo nchi ya Korea Kusini imesha toka mu maskini hivi ni nchi tajiri hivi ni nchi wakati wa ufunguzi huo Serembe alizungumzia jinsi ambavyo serikali inavyohimiza wakulima kuongezea thamani mazao yao pamoja na kujiunga na mpango wa kimaendeleo wa parish development mo- to develop our families to give us the to develop ourselves to give us the the to develop our villages to the to and to develop our countries and to the the Odo. ameusifu mpango wa SMU kutoka Korea kwa kuchochea maendeleo ya vijiji to take place for people to transform let's work on their mindset and in Uganda we want to testify the communities that have taken this positively are moving towards a positive direction. Kinachofuata hivi sasa ni mapumziko machache kutoka studio. I remember the lockdown when the streets were empty and our lives disrupted when business is closed and our livelihoods hung in the balance hospitals were full we lost loved ones jobs and hope our children couldn't study anymore we cannot let this happen again we should not go back get fully vaccinated against covid-19 and join the millions of ugandans who are already vaccinated Tales of Kasozi brought to you by Uganda Communications Commission. Hello. Hello. This is Kasozi. How can I help you? Hey, Kasozi, my brother. Long time. We last met when we were at campus. It's been a while, but you are the person I'm looking for. Campus? Really? Hey, you don't remember me. Okay. So how can I help you? I'm stuck in Gulu making millions and I need to urgently send money to my sick mother. Mm-hmm. But I can't find any mobile money agent near me. I've sent the money to your phone as you can see the message. Eh? It might take a few minutes to come through, but I urgently need you to send the money to my mother. Let me send you her number and you send it to her chap chap. Ah, my friend, I'm afraid your mom is going to die. What? Cuz I don't know you. I never went to campus and I'm also in Gulu. So can we meet at CPS we talk about it? Olimusiru. <laughs> Stay tuned for what Kasozi does next. Tofira, refrain from unnecessary engagement with strangers over the phone. This message is powered by the Uganda Communications Commission. Hii ni UBC TV na katika taarifa yetu ya mwisho kwa siku ya leo askofu mkuu wa kanisa anglikana Dr. Stephen Kazimba Mugalu ametoa ushauri kwa wananchi kuwaunga mkono wale ambao wana mawazo ya kazi za ubunifu yanayolenga kulisaidia taifa kutimiza malengo ya mwaka elfu mbili na arobaine. Askofu Kazimba wakati wa sherehe aliyasema haya wakati wa sherehe ya kutoa shukran kwa taasisi ya utafiti 
wazao la migomba ya Banana Industrial Research Development Center BADC wilayani Bushenyi. Taasisi hiyo iliundwa miaka miwili iliyopita kwa juhudi za Rais Museveni kwa lengo la kuongezea thamani zao la migomba kwenye mkoa wa West Ankole. Because we used to throw away all the cold food. So when you cook and cool the food, you also get and dry it. You get a, a, a magic flower. That flower is like, it's like milk. When you put it in hot water, it just dissolves away. And that's what makes us our instant porridge and uh, our instant mumbo. We should love our country. We should love men and women who are contributing something to develop our country. We should support them. We shouldn't really pull them down. You know we have many, many PhD holders today. When someone is going up, they are pulling them the PhD. Pull him down. Pull her down. We have all along been losing our matoke because of due to lack of market. And you, have, you know the president has been advocating for value addition. They have added value to Amatoke. Now that they have transformed themselves into a commercial entity, we expect them to produce a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of Matoke in the form of flour that will be sold locally and internationally. This will definitely create employment and also income to our people. Uganda is the second largest producer of bananas in the world, second to China. And therefore, and that's even when our production is so low. So if we put in um, irrigation, if we put in fertilizers, we, we plant the right varieties of bananas with proper spacing, we can even be the first in the world. And we can supply the world with banana flower, banana products. <laughs>
sehemu ya New York pamoja na London lakini hapa kwetu Nairobi tunataja hali ya mchanganyiko wa jokari na jua kuchomoza pamoja na Dubai lakini Paris itakuwa mvua ya rasharasha na hali joto ya nyuzi 25 asante sana kujenga nasi tuonane hadi mwingine kwa heri Thank <laughs> you.